everyone. Good evening and welcome to the most uh, awaited uh, session of this week. Um, the favorite session, of course, samosachai.net session. Uh, I'm Trishala Jain and I lead the developer marketing for Azure for Microsoft India. And my job is to excite the developers in India to use the latest and greatest tools uh, all on Azure and, of course, all the tools in Microsoft. So today we're going to be coming uh, live to you from Bengaluru. The weather is awesome here. It's raining and um, uh, what more, uh, you know, than having samosa and chai. So today's session is all about .NET MAUI multi-platform app UI and uh, we have three amazing uh, tech SMEs who are going to be talking and chatting all about Maui today. So let me bring uh, in and introduce uh, Nish and Vivek. Hey, hey everyone. Vivek. Hi Nish. How are you? Hey, Trishal, it's good to see you on the show. It's a, it's a <laughs> yeah. surprise for us. Absolutely. Right, it's a surprise. It's a surprise for audience, Nish. I wanted to make sure <laughs> we have surprises, and we are in the kitchen, so it's yeah, yeah that's a lovely kitchen. Hey, that's a real kitchen, right? By the way, I'm having my chai, and where is your samosas, guys? Where are your samosas? Um, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> the, for us, the samosa right now is uh, James doing the Maui session. That's our uh, <laughs> this right. So, um, I mean, yeah. I, have, I have done this before, like having the chai here and spilled it all over. So I don't want to do that. So I didn't <laughs> even carry the chai, any food here right now. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a way <laughs> for now. It's it's like uh, you have seen Popeye show where he eats the spinach yeah, yeah. and he gets the oh, power. Yeah. So before this show, I have samosas and then I come to the show so that we get the power <laughs> to have the great session here. Wow, that's a big that's line. amazing. If someone eats samosas, they're going to sleep. Not come to a show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 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 Nish, Nish mm -hmm. uh, I have a question to you. Yeah. So, how does a developer, uh, a common developer, become a Superman? Oh my God. I have no idea. Do they wear a Superman shirt or something? Yeah, like this. You have a GitHub, you, okay. have, you need to have GitHub, and then. Uh -huh. Yeah. What is that? Oh, that's wow. a C sharp. I can see that. <laughs> we okay, can't see it. C sharp. <laughs> <laughs> that's a C sharp T-shirt. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so Trishali, you may not know the reason. One of the reasons why we mm -hmm. started this show is basically me teaching Vivek .NET and C sharp. We went on mm -hmm. uh, talking about it a lot in the evenings, and we said like, okay, mm -hmm. let's do a show, Samosa Chai, and then we started teaching Vivek. And the first thing we started doing was uh, doing about microservices because something which he was very, very familiar with. So we took, took, uh, took an advanced topic and started speaking about microservices. And now look at that. He's, he's already C sharp, b wow. if I can say wow. that word. <laughs> yeah, I was like wondering, Samosa, Chai, and tech talks and tech discussions, mm -hmm. what's happening? <laughs> yeah, that's all his idea, though. OK, interesting but, uh, history. <laughs> wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Let's... So yeah. Let's get started with the with the code of conduct um, before we forget that. Absolutely. So uh, this is a Microsoft Reactor session. So we are partnering with the teams here, Reactor Bangalore. And uh, one of the important aspects here is to follow this code of conduct. So we just want to be very welcoming to everyone here, be aware of uh, you know there is the different cultures. Um, you know, even though we the show is kind of like. Uh, hosting hosted for Indian audience, and that's where the name Samosa Chai. But we are streaming in all all the platforms, so uh, let's be nice to everyone. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the important message here with the code of conduct. Okay, let's let's thank everyone here, right? So this show has been. Is kind of a watch party being delivered by the Azure developer community in how many cities, Nish? 60? Yeah, hey, it's, it's 100. Yeah. It's 100, 100, right? 100. So 100 was our aim. So Vivek worked okay. really hard to get uh -huh. 100 cities, but we got managed to get about 60 cities here. And oh, okay. uh, I mean, I got to be honest with you, I, didn't, I did not know some of the cities like uh, Satna. 
uh, and yeah. Haldia. I'm getting to pronounce them now. Yeah. Some of them. So these are the cities I didn't even know. I'm Amazing. so glad that you know we have developers from these uh, cities. Uh, we would love to know about you. I mean, uh, write in your comments which city are you joining in from, so we know that you know, like where are you joining from. So this is really good to know about this. Yeah, and maybe they can even write us some good comments, right? What are some of the things that they're, you know, getting to learn from this show, or what are some of the cool things they love about this show? Yeah, <laughs> we cool. would love to hear all the good things. <laughs> right. Then right. we go next. So these are uh, amazing communities. Uh, we have Indian Institute of Technology Madras uh, joining us from the watch parties perspective. And also we have great student ambassadors from Microsoft Learn. Uh, they've been doing watch parties as well. And we also want to have a special thanks to Pune User Group, one of the oldest .NET communities in India. And they also have agreed to host uh, this show. Sorry, wow. in the host of watch party, yeah. Thank you amazing. so much, guys. This is amazing that you know you all signed up for this, and um, yeah, we saw we saw Nepal. We we're seeing London. That's amazing. Uh, we are seeing Brazil. We are seeing Brazil as well. Wow, this is. Wow. I think this is the advantage of having uh, this time zone, right? Yeah. We're able to yeah. get all these amazing folks joining in from Europe. Oh, we have Belgium. people from Belgium. That's amazing. Hey, everyone, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Cool. Oh, we have someone from Florida too. I thought I thought James was the only person who's joining from US. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I saw someone joining from Chennai. I wonder how the weather is. Oh yeah. Okay. India. Okay. India. Great. So so yeah, let's Denmark. um so so basically uh we're gonna learn Mobi today. And uh, the agenda is very simple. So we're going to get started with Mavi. And, uh, and then next up, uh, myself and uh, Nish are going to you know, talk to you all about uh, the building backend for that Mavi, right? So mm -hmm. how to build a scalable backend to that Mavi using cont Azure Container Apps, but it is not limited to that, right? So that we are going to anyways discuss that. Um, and whatever, uh, you know, uh, James is going to teach us all today. Uh, it's been, you know, put it as a learning material, as a learn path, basically. So if you go to this uh, samosachai.net uh, and there is a QR code, there is a 28 days, uh, you know, left for this challenge to complete from today. So it's around seven modules, Nish, seven to eight modules um, yep. where you're going to learn end to end of Maui. So in a particular show like this, we can only teach a couple of things. And probably tomorrow we are going to do hands on session as well, where you can also come in and, uh, you know, build something from a, from a mobile uh, UI perspective. Uh, but that, that is all, you know, uh, tomorrow. And today we are anyways going to see how to do it end to end uh, from a development perspective. Right. So if you want to go you know, in depth and uh, you know, get your hands dirty, right? This is uh, amazing, uh, you know, cloud skill challenge which we have launched. So you can go back and uh, take up these uh, learn modules and complete all those learn modules uh, to get familiar with Maui and uh, build some amazing uh, mobile apps and multi-platform apps and not not just mobile apps, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let let let's. Uh, move forward and bring in James. Uh, James has been waiting. Hey, everyone. Good evening. Yes. How's it going? James, good, evening, good to James. wake you up so good much uh, so early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I did I did uh, what's up Nish this morning. I was like, I'm awake. Don't worry. I am I am here. It is happening. <laughs> I think that's the important part. I told I told him I was like, I'm gonna wake up. And if I wake up, then we're good. So but I didn't right. make, I didn't make any chai. I didn't make some 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 coffee. So I think it's too. I think it's too early for chai I'm over here. At least I feel like the the first time, the first time I went out to a like an actual like authentic like Indian restaurant in Seattle when I when my first job in Seattle, uh, we went out and it was it was one of those situations. Where I was like, oh, I'll get get some chai, bring it over, and I swear I felt like the the cup of chai never like had a dent in it. Like it never went down ever because they were always just coming around and refilling it. Yeah, so refilling. It was always at the brim. Yeah. So by the end, I think I drank so much chai that I was like, I don't want to drink any more chai for like a year. But I do love chai in general. Yes. <laughs> uh, but coffee this morning. I'm going to drink a lot of coffee. So I was up at like four o'clock. Not bad. 
not bad, but I did go to bed early. So, but I'm excited because uh been looking forward to this. I don't even mean, planning it. Forever, I think. Yeah. yeah, since when we started planning Maui, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's been it's been ever. We've been thinking about doing uh, you know, spe specifically uh Indian audiences where we don't get to speak a lot in our time zones. So we're thinking, okay, we should do a lot more. And a nice t a nice shirt, by the way, uh, James. So just uh, just tell us, tell us, because we do not know what that what that shirt really means. Hey, is he is he going for a vacation or something to a beach yeah. after this um, session? Hey, uh, James, we we are like jealous about you now. <laughs> so that was that's what's kind of interesting about Dana Maui. Like obviously, it is like one of those like shortened abbreviations. But uh, a lot of times you'll see things with like a, uh, a island type of theme or vacation holiday type of theme because in Hawaii, there's a bunch of islands. So Hawaii is one of our states off, off the mainland. And, um, and one of the islands is Maui. So Maui is a very, very popular um, destination. I don't know, it's not, I wouldn't say it's my favorite state or favorite island in Hawaii. They're all my favorite. I like Kona, which is the big island a lot because it's very diverse uh, weather-wise. Like you can be in the middle and it'll be like downpouring, but then you drive like five minutes, like super hot. And then it's like, it's just like really, really cool. Uh, Maui is also beautiful. So they're all beautiful tropical islands. Um, I like um, Kauai as well. Um, they're all nice. So we, if people get to go out there, the Hawaiian islands are super beautiful uh, as well. But there's, you know, think of it as just like another, if you're going to, a, a, I think if you're going to a island anywhere, you're in that vacation holiday mode, you got that island. It's yeah. an island theme uh, to it. So that's kind of what Don and I see. So you often see a lot of that going on there. Nice. So I got I got a few. I had a few of these shirts. I had all these shirts before um, <laughs> before we even put the name to Don and Maui. So this is just classic James apparel. <laughs> nice. Nice. I had to I had to basically make room because half of the wardrobe is just C sharp shirts. And then the other side is now just Hawaiian shirts. So oh, that's good. Yeah. It's it was my wardrobe for a long time working at Xamarin, like a lot of C sharp shirts. Yeah, and nice. We, we don't we don't want to talk about as developers. Uh, we don't want to talk about the wardrobe t shirts which we have. <laughs> it's like my wife is like, why why do you bring all this stuff? <laughs> the the series of developer shirts, and then I, I don't know. I really like I like colorful, <laughs> bright shirts for some reason. There's there, but you know, Nish and I have worked together for like was it like eleven years now, Nish? Yeah, ten years, more than ten years. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's impressive. <laughs> Can't believe he puts up with me. Ah, uh, <laughs> James. Uh, okay, if the viewers didn't know, James is my manager as well. So it's uh, it's it's oh, a good wow. thing for me to wake him up at five a.m. and make him come up on the show, right? It's easy. I'm just a person. Well. I I am <laughs> I am I am a manager, but I I'm just everyone. I just want to be your friend, Nish. That's all. <laughs> so. It's fun, fun. Okay. All right, all right. So, so James, tell us what are, what's what's Maui, and um, let's get started. Yeah, I'm ready. I got a whole presentation today. What I want to do is, it's someone was asking in the chat. I saw here from LinkedIn, or even streaming to LinkedIn. You know, you could stream to LinkedIn. That's amazing. Tons of messages really for beginners. Smart. I'm gonna do the, like the yeah. beginner session. It's kind of cool because, um, you know, I've been a .NET developer for. I was just thinking about this. I think it's been like 16 years. I think I started with .NET and C Sharp. Um, yeah, I think in 2005, 2006, I'm like my first year in college. I was doing all C++ and I was a game developer. And then I learned C Sharp and it just like blew my mind. It was like the coolest thing ever. And I was writing all sorts of amazing desktop applications. And then uh, I actually went to, it's funny people are talking about Windows Phone, but literally that's what started my career. So like without Windows Phone, I wouldn't be here today. So thanks, Windows Phone. I, you know, was a huge fan. Uh, had one. Uh, have some in a drawer over here as well. But I went to a conference on, in Washington on campus, a Microsoft campus, PDC. And it blew me away because we were talking about Microsoft Azure. It was Windows Azure at the time. They were launching the Windows Phone 7. They gave everybody this device that had all these like international chargers and all this other stuff. And... Uh, it just was the coolest thing. I literally went back to my hotel room that night and I wrote my first uh, mobile application. I never, you know, it just, I had this super computer in my pocket and it like blew my mind. And I, I quit my job. I was working at Canon, writing printer software. It was my first job out of college. I was, you know, a 20, 
I don't know, it was like 24, 25. And I was like, whatever, it's good. Quit, you know, changing my stars. I'm like, I, I like I saw it, right? I think it's just like I was like, oh my goodness, like this, this is it. Like I, this is what I want to do with my life is I want to build mobile applications. And uh, I, I moved to Seattle. I took a job at a small startup and I was tasked with building an iOS, Android, Windows phone and Windows 8 application. And there was only thing out there that could do it, which was Xamarin and C Sharp and .NET all together. Uh, and, and that's what I did. That's what I picked. That's what I chose. And I was the solo developer for two years, building all their mobile applications. We were building DVR, hardware, software, all, all this cool stuff. And then I, Nish asked me to join Xamarin. I said, yeah, Nish, I'm in. I'll join. Actually, I think when I when they they sent me a, a job posting for uh, um, for um developer advocate i didn't even know what that was i had no idea i didn't even know it was a, i was like i'm a developer i don't know i thought it was an mvp program i literally thought it was like an mvp program because i knew about microsoft mvp and i was like cool I, i'll be an mvp and then they're like cool we'll set up the interview time blah 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 like what days are you available i was like what what is going on and then all of a sudden i was like they flew me to san francisco and i was sitting down with nat friedman you know the the founder one of the founders of xamarin i was like i guess i'm joining xamarin and then now i'm here like that, that, I don't know if you know that. It's like I had no idea like what, that I was even applying for a job. Uh, I knew they hired you, and we met. That's 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 the only you know thing I know. I mean, I I joined Xamarin. I think when Xamarin Forms, they were writing the first set of code. It was called Duplo. Yep. When Jason Smith was writing, so I I flew to San Francisco, met Nat, uh, spent there for one month. Um, so I was hired for this role called developer evangelist because I was an evangelist for a previous company. Uh, and then I wrote to Nat on LinkedIn. I said, like, okay, I'm excited about this tooling because I got to explore it. And then, then Nat and I connected and then, uh, then he flew me to San Francisco and that's how we started. But yeah, what James has been doing there, I was doing this out of the world. We built some communities here on Xamarin, um, like everywhere. I think in the APAC, we, we did it in India, Vietnam, Philippines, and, and many places in, inside and in Southeast Asia. So. Yeah. This is this is this has been an amazing journey for us on, on in Xamarin, right? I mean, like I, I know the the last evolve that we did, uh, James and I. Uh, okay, I don't know if you, Trishala and Vivek, know this. James and I, we did the keynote together with Nat, and we were actually fighting between coffee and chai. And <laughs> so, if you, yeah, I, I, I'm a avid chai, chai drink, drinker, and James is a coffee drinker. So we have the entire conversation there up in the keynote. Uh, section of the Xamarin's YouTube. I, I guess it's, it's still there. I, I don't it's know. Still there. I haven't checked. Yeah. Okay. I saved them. Yeah. You know why it's called Duplo, the, right? The, yeah. The fight is still on. The fight is still on in some of <laughs> Forever. Well, well, I think, you know, I think there's like a, I think coffee culture around the globe is really transforming. And like I, I was recently watching a bunch of videos about uh, coffee culture in India and a lot of the beans mm -hmm. coming out of India right now, a lot of, uh, a lot of people are doing a lot of blends with them over here and like doing unique things. I'm, I'm actually, I'm pretty interested to learn more about coffee culture. That's what Nish and I, Nish and I, when we do one-on-ones, we don't actually talk about work. We just talk about, actually, we just talk about pho photography and Lightroom yep. and how much it confuses me. So it's <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, I don't know. Nish is like an amazing everything, videographer, photographer, all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, honestly, it's like Instagram is just like, it blows me away. I was like, I, I was like, I don't even know what you're doing here. Because <laughs> like, I, I, feel wish, like, you be like I should follow you on Insta now to see some cool yeah. photography that you do. And off late, I got to know that uh, Nish is also into cinematography. That's yeah, that age. that was my recent pick. Like because, yeah. um, like so, we so, do technical so James, videos, we get exposed uh, to videos. Yep. So James, uh, uh, let, let's get started with like basic like. Vivek's ready. Of them. Vivek's yeah, like, stop ready. talking, James. Let's do it. All right, fine. <laughs> yeah yeah and i think people are getting restless i see some serious questions which are uh, which are like flowing in the comment section so i think we should just get serious about the movie now this is a serious side of things all right i'm i'm ready over here i can see whenever you bring up my bring up my bring up my desktop and we'll be good to go all right so vivek and i will be hanging around we'll be taking questions from everyone uh so trishala we'll see you in a bit yes see ya so yeah cool awesome right, all right thanks. guys well i have a solo monitor over here but i have a whole nother computer over here that i'm going to be um monitoring the chat and things on as well so that's a good
questions come in. I'll try to answer some of those as I go through. I try to like to na naturally answer questions as well as we're going through stuff. Um, but feel free, Vivek and Nish, to pop in if you're like, I need an answer right now. If it's like something that as I'm going through. But uh, as a, everyone said, I'm James Montemagno. So I've been a long time uh, .NET uh, mobile developer, desktop developer, web developer, developing all the things with C Sharp. And today I want to talk about the new newest sort of next iteration, I would say, of cross-platform application development uh, with .NET. And you know, when we think about C Sharp, we think about .NET. You know, C Sharp is a language we write every single day to build powerful applications. And underneath the hood, .NET is really what's powering all of that. So it's a runtime, it's a set of class libraries, it's infrastructure, it's compilers, it's components, it's those languages that we know and love. It's the ecosystem that we're all part of. It really enables us to build for any single platform, right? So if I'm a C Sharp developer, I can build for cloud, web, desktop, mobile, gaming, IoT, AI. There's a great framework available for me to take advantage of and build great applications. Now, sometimes I can build like just a game, right? With Unity, for example, and I can write C Sharp and it's powered by .NET. Or maybe I'm building like a powerful serverless Azure function and I'm writing that with C Sharp. And sometimes what we want to do is write, you know, a web app. And then we want to maybe share some common logic with that Azure function or with a desktop or mobile application. And the whole goal is that what .NET wants to be is run beautifully and natively on all these platforms. Now, I'm going to focus, mostly focus on the desktop and mobile part, because for me, this has been the thing that I've loved for decades. I've basically been all about building applications across desktop, mobile, and the other form factors that mobile comes up, which would be like tablets and things like that. So when we look at the landscape today, we're targeting the vast majority of devices that users are, are using on the desktop with graphical user interfaces. You know, we look to target Windows, Mac OS, iOS, and Android, um, and of course, iPad OS and Android tablets as well. So when we think about this, one thing that's already prevalent is that .NET runs on all of these different platforms. Obviously, you can build Windows applications with .NET, and there's a bunch of different UI frameworks. With Mac OS, .NET is part of the story there. Same with iOS and Android. .NET has an optimized runtime that runs on each of those platforms, and you can build in the specific UI framework that you would like on those things. If you want to use AppKit, UIKit, WinUI 3, you can use those on the different platforms because .NET is there. Now, when we want to build for these different platforms, we, of course, have the option of building independently based on our application. Maybe that's the right choice. Maybe I'm only building, let's say, the Microsoft Store application, which only going to be on Windows. And I want to take advantage of every single bit of the, the Windows app SDK and WinUI 3 and like build a beautiful application right there. But often, you might need to go to multiple platforms. You still want your applications to be beautiful and native and take advantage of those different features. And that's where .NET MAUI comes in, the multi-platform app UI, which enables us to build and develop native applications from a single code base that perform great on all the great, amazing consumer devices out there today across Android, iOS, Mac, and Windows. And like I said, it's all from a single code base. I'm going to talk about that today. We're going to do a bunch of demos and get into some code. Um, but what's really cool about .NET MAUI is that it's actually an evolution if you've been a long time .NET developer using Xamarin or Xamarin Forms. It's sort of just the next version that's been sort of re-architected from the ground up, all on top of .NET 6, the latest iteration of .NET. So it's fully cross-platform. Now, what's really great about this, and we'll talk about it, is that there is actually an upgrade path for you to bring your existing Xamarin and Xamarin Forms applications to .NET MAUI or to .NET 6. And there's a great documentation on that. Now. What I mean, it's part of .NET 6. What I mean is that it has a lot of distinct properties. One, that there's a unified .NET with .NET 6. And .NET 6 brings one base class library that's unified across all the different platforms. It also brings in a modern lifecycle support, SDK style projects, command line interface support, and a whole bunch more. It's going to support not only the mobile and desktop workloads for iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows. It also takes advantage of the latest Mac technology, Mac Catalyst, which is really popular. And additionally, you can build hybrid applications, which I'll talk about. So if you're a web developer today, stick around because I got some really cool stuff 
helps you bring your existing web app to desktop and mobile with .NET MAUI and Blazor. And even if you have a React app or an Angular app, you can bring it in as well, uh, which is really cool. And additionally here, it's all about this productive development environment. So you get to take advantage of the latest and greatest. So with this, and what we'll see is that there is single project support that brings in a whole bunch of cross-platform goodies that really simplify development. It means you get to take advantage of .NET Hot Reload, XAML Hot Reload, and take advantage of the built-in dependency injection services and Microsoft extensions and a whole lot more. So good questions in the chat. Like if you've been a long time Xamarin developer, what's the difference with .NET MAUI? Well, it's a great question. Well, one, and we'll get to it, is that as an evolution, you get all of the goodness from Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, which is being able to build native cross-platform apps with C Sharp and .NET. Now with Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, it's really focused on mobile though, just really on iOS and Android, where .NET MAUI is focused on cross-platform desktop and mobile and enabling hybrid scenarios to share application logic with the web. These are brand new things. I actually have a whole slide of what's new and what's and what's not there. But being built on .NET 6, it means we get a unified base class library. So your code is expected to run you know, exactly the same between those different projects. You get common SDK style support, CLI support, which means you get common infrastructure and GitHub Actions, Azure DevOps, or other CI CD pipelines. Um, .NET MAUI ships with .NET, which means that when .NET updates, .NET MAUI updates on this release cadence cycle. And at a core architecture level, .NET MAUI is built from the ground up for performance with a brand new handler implementation for all of the controls. So there's a whole lot in there um, that's brand new for developers. And what that leads to is a more productive development environment and faster and smaller applications for you. Now, what this looks like is the ability to build out a big shared code base. So this is your UI resources, your platform features, and your business logic. So for example, your business logic, these are things like your models, view models, RESTful service calls, your, your C-sharp.net code, right? This is just C-sharp business logic, it's code. that you are gonna run, you're gonna perform some math operations, boom, you're gonna access the file system, boom. Um, anything that's inside of .NET, that is your business logic that can be shared across the different platforms. Now, you also offer up, obviously, cross-platform native UI. You, you can write UI in UIKit and AppKit and Android XML as well if you want to, but .NET MAUI brings a full shared cross-platform UI framework into the mix. It also offers a bunch of cross-platform resources that I'll talk about, like app icons, splash screens, fonts, images, translation files, styles, and a bunch more. And additionally, built directly into .NET MAUI is access to over 70 native platform features, um, such as connectivity, device sensors, and a lot more. You can start developing today with Visual Studio 2022. Um, you can use the current stable version on Windows, uh, Visual Studio uh, 2022 version 17.3. So that is the, uh, the version number, if you will. And then over on the Mac, you have Visual Studio for Mac. Currently, you'll need the preview of Visual Studio for Mac. Um, over there. So that's going to be Visual Studio 2022 for Mac version 17.4 preview one. So that's the current version. You can check down in Maui and check the iOS and Android workloads and you'll be good to go and do all this stuff there. And what's great is that the same project, same solutions are going to open between the different IDEs that are all there as well. Cool. Now, the thing that I love about down in Maui is that it's going to look familiar if you're coming from an existing C sharp background, even if you're coming from ASP.NET Core, there's a lot of similarities of how the application is structured in the startup code. But what it also means is that it's been restructured in a way that's brand new, that takes advantage of the latest technologies, but also developer productivity and specifically with single projects. So when I create a new project, I get one project that lets me to deploy to multiple platform targets. And I'm going to show what this looks like in a demo, but when you do file new, you're going to get this, you know, out of the box application that's themed and styled for cross-platform development for light theme and dark theme and everything like that. And I'll talk about, um, after we kind of get into a little bit of code of what this actually means to be native and the performance gains that we get and how we can access native UI as well. So let's first go in and take a look over here. Um, so I'm going to go in and the first thing that you'll need to do is install Visual Studio 2022. So I'm going to do my demos here on Windows, but of course you can apply the same thing to Mac as well. Now I'm running the preview. I only run a preview. 
That's how I do it. Why live any other life? I always live on the edge, I say. You can actually install the current preview side-by-side -side stable. So if you want to run stable, you can do it there. When you open up uh, Visual Studio stable or preview, uh, and you uh, check right here, this .NET MAUI app development, that's all you need. Just one checkbox, you're good to go. If you want to do other stuff like me, I do web development, Azure development, uh, Windows, C++ development. I do a little bit of everything. So I like to check all the boxes in there too. You can you know, do Unity development, do a bunch of stuff. You can do all the stuff. So that's all you need. Then when you do an open up Visual Studio 2022, what you're going to get is the ability to create a new project. And inside of here, uh, what we're going to see is a bunch of different templates. So if I zoom in here, let's see if that's going to zoom. Maybe not today. There we go. There we go. All right. So over here, put my magnifier over there. You have all these different templates. So if you just go like this, you'll see all the stuff that you installed. Visual Studio can build basically anything. There's all the things. To make it really easy, there's a MAUI dropdown. And there's three different project templates here. The first one is the .NET MAUI application built with native UI, with XAML or C Sharp. And this is our hybrid app that we'll talk about later on. And then just a class library. So I'm just going to go and double tap on the uh, file new over here. And I'm going to create a MAUI app 19. That's a good name. And here we can see I'm just selecting .NET 6 as my target. I'm going to hit create. And this is going to create my .NET MAUI application over here. And this is going to give me that um, common single project that we saw earlier coming from, um, from the template. So let me go ahead and make this a little bit bigger over here. I'm going to zoom in because I think this is pretty cool. Is what we get out of the box is a .NET MAUI application that targets Android, iOS, Mac, and Windows. And you see there's little warning buttons here because right now all the dependencies and NuGet packages are all coming in and lighting up for me as I start to create it. When my project's ready, those will, those will go away. Now, what's also great here is that I have a bunch of other resources in here. So .NET MAUI will automatically take care of the cross-platform stuff that I don't want to uh, have or need to worry about. So for example, things like app icons, I can put them in these resource folders, fonts, uh, cross-platform fonts. If your designer has fonts you want to use, uh, images. So here we have an SVG file. What's cool is that .NET MAUI, when you give it app icon or splash screen configurations, you can give them PNG or JPEGs or SVGs. And the SVGs will automatically be resized and scaled for the different densities for the different platforms automatically. We have splash screens in here, raw assets like text files, JSONs, or database files, and then, of course, styles as well. So here there's a default set of colors, for example, and that will enable you to restyle your application with just a few lines of code. And then also over here is uh, styles.xaml. So inside of here, this is a default style sheet, if you will, for every single thing, kind of a kind of bootstrap for your application as well, which is cool. Now, at the end of the day, what we're going to be doing is sort of loading our application in this main program file. And what's cool here is that this is a host builder pattern. So this is coming from ASP.NET Core. So if you're coming from that world, it's going to look familiar. We have a uh, use Maui app. We have configure fonts. You can add lifecycle events here and a lot more. And you can also register things for dependency injection and IOC and all that good stuff. We can see that it's using a Maui app, which is quite cool. And this Maui app over here is the startup code that says start up our code into our app shell. Every app has a series of windows associated with it. So this creates one window. And our app shell enables us to do things like fly out navigation with the things that fly out from the left and um, right. And then over on the or tabs on the top and on the bottom. And then at this instance here, it's going to create a single page. And the single page is a series of controls and views for my application. So here I have a scroll view. I have an image. I have a label. I have a button down here. And they have different events. They have accessibility property, like these semantic properties, level headings, click events, and a lot more. Now, this button, for example, 
is an actual button. So we'll talk about how this is native and different from other cross-platform frameworks. But when we create a button, this is a .NET MAUI button. But when it's rendered on the page, this is going to be an actual native control that can be a WinUI 3 control, a um, control uh, for Android, um, or a, a UI kit uh, control as well on iOS. So you get these different capabilities built right in. So I just went up into the debug menu. Windows was selected. And I hit debug, and it's going to compile up my uh, native Windows application here and start debugging. So here we go. I'm actually over here. If I look here, we can see that I have my, my application. I can click over here and increase it to 10. Now, I'm on a single display and monitor, so I can actually bring up this XAML Live Preview if I wanted. This is this is new. This is pretty cool. I get a live preview of my application. I can actually hover over different elements. I can tap on it, and actually, it'll jump me to that source code. Um, I also have the ability to add like grid lines in here so I can actually like do some design work, which is quite nice. Um, I can go into this live visual tree as well, which gives me a representation of all the different controls. You can see the actual XAML live preview lights up. So it actually helped me jump around in my code if I have a lot of controls in there as well, which is kind of cool. Now I can also say, um, uh, hello, uh, Samosa Chai. Dot net. And we can see that my application is updating in real time over here with XAML Hot Reload. I didn't even have to save this file. If I open the actual kit application, you can see that the application is updated in real time. So I'm just making modifications to my code. It updates in real time, and we're good to go. Now, the same thing is true if I look at the code behind. If I come over here and I you know, add a breakpoint, for example, and I interact with the app, I get a breakpoint. I have all the power of Visual Studio to inspect my elements, I have locals, I have watch windows, I have, you know, diagnostic views, or I have performance metrics here on windows, you know, memory, CPU usage, all this stuff, I can take a, advantage of all this stuff that's coming in. Now, I can also take a look at the native controls that are on on here, I can take a look at every single property that's coming in the fonts that are being used. And then of course, I can continue on. And we can see that it increased there. And of course, in my live preview, the other thing I can do is I can just make code modifications and I can hit this little hot reload button for my C sharp code. I can also say hot reload on file save. And when I do that, it's now going to increase by 10 every single time I tap on it. So you can actually see that right there is I'm not only modifying my XAML, but I'm also modifying my C sharp code in real time. So for example, if I wanted to come in to here, and add another button and say, uh, let's say text and say, hello, everyone, or let's say, hello, um, yeah, hello, everyone. And let's do, let's just add it in there so we see it, cool. And let's do horizontal option center. And then let's do a clicked event. I'm just gonna have it add a new click handler for me. There we go. So it's gonna generate some code for me automatically. Um, then we should see it go away because it's been generated. And then down here, I have this button click. So I could do something like um, display uh, alert. There's alerts and there's action sheets. And there's different things built into .NET MAUI. So I could say hello, and then I'll say um, world. And then I could do uh, OK. There we go. I'm going to display a little alert. I'm going to hit hot reload here, open up the app, and sure enough, Look at that. We get our hello world right here and uh, a native WinUI 3 button because it's built on native control. So I get that native look and feel at the end of the day. So I never had to stop coding, do that stuff there. Now I've gone in and I've just created this all in XAML because I like XAML. You can also create things in C sharp. So if you don't want to do XAML, you can do it in C sharp too or F sharp. Um, it's all up to you. Now, what's cool here is that I just started writing some code and it worked. And if I actually open the project file, this is another one of my favorite things, is that we can see up here that I'm actually multi-targeting. So here I'm targeting Android, iOS, Mac, and if I'm on Windows, also Windows as well. So if I just go over, we have Windows here too. It also supports Samsung Tizen, which is pretty cool. So if you want to develop for Samsung devices for Tizen, you can do that. 
But what's great is that when we talk about cross-platform, multi-platform stuff, it's not just about the UI, it's about the other stuff to help developers' lives be easier to develop for. So things like cross-platform application titles, application identifiers, version codes, so you can easily bump those things inside of your CI and CD. This is really cool, supported in target platforms. This enables you to, on each platform, decide how far back and how far forward you wanna support each platform. So here I'm saying on Android support, all the way back to Android 21 and iOS 14.2, for example, which is cool. And then we have all these resources. So your app icon, where you specify your files, your splash screen, your images, where you can specify base sizes and really fine grain control, your fonts and your raw assets as well. Now, what's great here is that since it does support many platforms, there is ability to access platform code. So inside of here, we have a little bit of Android and iOS code all inside of C Sharp. And I'll talk about how this works. But inside of Windows, for example, I have manifest files and app startup code, and it's winning using you know the WinUI code that's inside of here. And I can access stuff if I want to, um, which means that I can also deploy to multiple targets. So if I go up here, I can see in my dropdown for debug, I can actually specify where I want to deploy. So on Windows, I'm on Windows, I can deploy to Windows. On Android, I'm going to switch to Android, and I have an Android emulator here. Now, I can plug in a physical Android device if I want to and put that in developer mode. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, of course, that'll just you know deploy normally uh, to my Android device. Or I can also bring up Android emulators. So here's an Android emulator. Um, I'm on Windows 10 right now, so I just have emulators available to me. In some countries, I know there's people tuning in from around the world, the Windows subsystem for Android is available, and I know a few more countries are getting it. That enables you to uh, build and deploy Win or Android apps directly on Windows 11, which is really cool. Um, but for any, any way, you can get access to emulators or um, devices as well. Now, this is going to now build up my Android application. Now, this is going to take a little bit longer than Windows because it's actually going through a native Android compilation. And of course, I'm live streaming. I got an emulator open. I got all this stuff open. A whole bunch of things are happening. So it might take even a little bit longer for us right now. But as we can see, there's things moving on the screen, which is always a good sign, as Nish knows, um, that when things are moving, that means things are happening. But it's actually compiling up a native Android package right here. It's signing the package, it's getting the package ready, it's found the emulator for me, it starts the emulator if it's not started, has all this stuff for me, and it actually starts a debug session right here inside of my application. So here we go. We have the same exact application, Hello Samosa Chai. It's wrapped because it's on a smaller screen. I can click and increase the count. I get the same stuff here. So here's my, you know, um, my screen, I have this uh, set to always on top, which is um, a great setting unless you want to show off a feature that makes it so it's not on top. So you can see it here, right? Um, you get that live visual tree. So you get the same stuff, right? Which is really, really cool. Um, I can hit hello, everyone. And now we're getting a um, Android button because it's an Android application, right? So I get that native uh, integration. Now, um, what's cool here is that it also enables me to deploy if I want to iOS or Mac. Now, on a, for Mac, you have to be on a Mac. You can actually do some packaging and you can do some things there. For iOS um, development, um, for sorry, let me make it clear. On For Mac application development, you got to have a Mac, just like on Windows, you got to have Windows. Android can be done Mac or Windows. Um, iOS is unique, so there's a few different ways to do development. One is to go to your Mac and just install Xcode and do things there um, and develop. The other way is to connect to a Mac. We actually have this uh, pair to a Mac, and you can pair to your Mac over the network. It'll do, do a remote build compilation package, and there's a remote iOS simulator. The other thing that you can do is if you have an Apple developer account, you can tell this to actually deploy to a local device. So I've taken my, my iPhone that's down here, and I'm going to deploy it here to my iPhone. I'm interested, James. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> so this is going to set up Hot Restart, which is a feature to deploy to a local iOS device. So I'm going to, I've signed in with my developer account. 
It's going to install anything that I need, which is nice. And now what this is going to do is it's going to sort of take our code and put it into a predefined package that's only for debug purposes, OK? This isn't going to let you like deploy it to the App Store or things like that, but it's going to package up my application and then deploy it directly onto my um, iOS device in a debug state. So uh, this covers you know, maybe like 80% of the use cases. There's certain device capabilities you want to have access to because it's an app inside of an app, if you will. Um, and this is a newer piece of technology that came out in the very late stages um, uh, before uh, .NET MAUI and things like that. OK, cool. So I have my application. I'm going to go ahead and launch it on my phone. And that's how it registers it here. And it's booting up. There we go. And it's going to go into a um, debug state for me. This should boot up. Cool. So I actually see it on my screen, but you can see it on this screen right here with XAML Live Preview. So this is literally my phone. Wow. Cool. Yep. And I can click and I can see it increase uh, over here. I can say, hello world. I get a native iOS pop up. This is pretty cool um, over there. I can do amazing. Breakpoints. Yeah. <laughs> a very I mean, I saw this idea. internal demo um, and uh, I was excited. I wanted to try it out. But, um, you know, watching you do it again, I was like, wow, this is something which I should now try it out <laughs> and figure it yeah. out how this needs to be done. So most of the time, I would say, um, I would say most of the time I deploy and I debug, you know, um, I have my, my phone in, in dark mode, obviously, here. Uh, so you can see the, the theme change. Most of the time, I just go to my Mac and do it um, just because I don't want to always plug in my device and do stuff. And simulators are, are, are pretty quick, um, you know, to build up a full package, right? But this is really nice when I'm just on the road with my machine. I can plug in my iOS device and go. And I do need an Apple developer account, though. I'm pretty sure you need a paid one as well. So be aware of that. It's a lot of restrictions on iOS and building and compiling. But if you have one, you're good to go. And a lot of good questions about Android. So oh, oh, my iPhone is plugged in through USB cable. So it's just plugged in normally. I think you just have to have iTunes installed. And that's pretty much it. And you log in there. Um, Say so it's plugged into USB. The For Android, anything that you can do with Android for debugging, maybe from Android Studio, you can do as well. So if you have, uh, you know, you can connect via an IP address, it shows up in the thing. Um, it, that totally works as well. But everything is supported, basically, yeah. So pretty cool. This is pretty neato, and it's cool that it just kind of lights up. And, you know, you get these exact same features as well. Like as we hover over, right, it goes to the, the different elements. You get the different styles. And this is it's really cool. You know, you get the same exact functionality and features across the board, um, which is which is cool. Um, um, so you get you get the, the hot reload, right? You see that says hello from iOS, which is quite cool. And then you you get that awesome stuff too. So that is pretty astonishing in general. Just the developer productivity built in there is really, really cool um, uh, right out of the gate for developers. And now if I wanted to, I could go to my Mac, boot up the Mac uh, application as well and go from there. Um, but let's talk about some of the other features that I think are really cool, which is the nativeness. These platform experiences are the best. I kind of showed Final News, some of the things that I love about the, the developer landscape. But to me, when we talk about native and when we're building native applications, the difference here is that you know we're building things with native controls and native libraries, native APIs native frameworks at the end of the day. So for us, that means using native control widgets and UI kits and the latest technologies like Mac Catalyst, which bundles up iOS applications uh, into native Mac applications with cool features and functionalities. And of course, using the win latest Windows um, app SDK and WinUI 3, which means you get advantage of all of that native stuff automatically and the native APIs, but all from C Sharp. It also means it goes through native compilation. So for example, on iOS and Android, there's native ahead of time compilation that basically produces native machine source code um, and ARM binaries for the different platforms that you can publish to your device, to the App Store, internally to your App Store as well. Now, this is part of .NET uh, and part of .NET 6. So when you're building, you're building on the latest generation of not only the UI technology stack with .NET MAUI, but also .NET itself. 
which leads to really great perf gains across the board. Now, performance is in the eye of the beholder, because what does that even mean? Does it mean that I can number crunch faster? Does it mean that I can hold up a frame rate? Does it mean that I can um, start in under a certain amount of time? Does it mean I can spin a, a ball? So you know what I mean? It really just depends on what you're thinking. Can I scroll really fast? What does it mean to you? Well, for a lot of developers, it means how long does it take to start up my application? And if you're coming from um, Xamarin Android or Xamarin Forms, and you upgrade and modernize your application with .NET MAUI, which we have great wiki articles and documentation on how to do that um, as well. So check that out on docs.microsoft.com. Um, and I'll talk about that here in a second. You get better performance. So here are the, the same exact applications, um, you know, file new projects going through and what is the startup time that's there. So for just an Android app with Android UI, we're looking at nearly 70% faster. So going from 300 millisecond startup to under 200. And then Xamarin Forms versus .NET MAUI are nearly 50% faster. So um, Xamarin Forms, the startup time was around 800 milliseconds. Now we're under about 550 milliseconds, so half a second. So really, really quick um, as far as the startup time for the application. Now, there's a lot of stuff in the box, but there's a lot of things that are new as well. So a lot of things are going to look somewhat familiar. So we have things like XAML and MVVM, different platforms, different UI features. We also get a backwards compatibility layer with Xamarin Forms. We get community toolkits. We get a bunch of new capabilities. So there's cross-platform graphics API with a full canvas available, borders, shadows, menu bars, themes, all those everything cross-platform you know, app icons, fonts, images. And there's a bunch of new changes from um, Xamarin as well. So built from the ground up, you get more namespaces, more compilation, uh, more lifecycle events. It's part of .NET and the workloads and a few new defaults as well. That means you get all sorts of great controls available to you. So over 50 controls, layouts, and views built into the box and a lot more, of course, as well. And how this works, what we saw, right, is that each platform Right? How do we get these cross-platform things? Well, each platform has a native control. It's like a UI activity indicator or progress bar. And what .NET MAUI gives you is an activity indicator or things like sliders and seek bars, you get a slider. So what the .NET MAUI team did and what other community members do is they, they build these custom handlers for each control to give you access to a cross-platform API. So that's really what we're accessing at the end of the day. Now, on top of that, there's a bunch of cool new things like multi-window support. Windows is called Windows because there's Windows. Um, and then, of course, you have you know iPad apps that are on big iPads that you want to span across multiple windows. So you have access to multi-window support directly in .NET MAUI, which is really awesome. It's really easy to open up. They all have their own lifecycle event as well. Now, another cool thing is that I've been talking about cross-platform APIs like .NET and the UI layer. But you can always get down to the native APIs as well. The Siri kit, AR kit, UI kit, map kit, those are available in C Sharp through C Sharp bindings. Same thing true for Android. So things like geolocation, picture in picture, Bluetooth, fingerprint, there's a whole bunch in there, um, which are nice. So for example, if there's an API you want to use that's from Android, you can use it. In fact, I just had someone tweet at me a, um, a video of them doing Bluetooth printing to a little printer, like a little receipt. If you go to the store and buy something, printing out a receipt from a .NET MAUI application, tapping in to those Android printer and Bluetooth APIs. It's cool. It's all available in C Sharp and available to me there too. But built in to .NET MAUI itself are a bunch of cross-platform API features, things like clipboard, device sensors, and network uh, notifications, a whole lot more. So over 70 of them built in to give you access to native API features. So for example, app actions, like when you like long press or right click on things on the desktop, you get access to those through a very simple API called set async, and you can get access to those immediately. Things like geolocation, you can get access to those in just a few lines of code. You can get last known location or query immediately. And of course, what's nice about all these built-in APIs is they're also unit testable and injectable with dependency injection and interfaces. So everything has an interface. You can use built-in dependency injection and inversion control. So if you've been a long-time .NET developer, you'll be good to go and you'll love it. So for example, if I want to access and integrate in, let's say, um, 
um, some platform features, I can go to the documentation over here and I could go down to platform integration. And we can see here on the overview page, we can see all the different stuff that I can go ahead and integrate. So things like application models gives me app action, app info, launcher, maps, permissions. I have email, networking, phone dot or web authentication, battery information, flat flashlight, vibration, media pickers, screenshots, text to speech, clipboard access, sharing files and text, file pickers, preferences, secure storage, and a whole lot more. So I can go into that application over here. And I could, if I wanted to, come into the Android source code. And I could go in and say, like, using, you know, Android dot, and I've accessed all the different namespaces, and I could access and write code there. But let's say I wanted to access, you know, the, like the internet. I could come over into my application over here, and let's just check for the internet. So instead of saying, hello world, I could say, bar has internet. I'll say, um, Maui, Microsoft dot Maui dot networking dot. And I have access to all of the networking APIs like connectivity built right in. And then I have access to things like the, if connectivity has changed, the connection profiles, the network access, and a lot more. So I could go in and I can say connectivity dot current dot network access. And I can see if it equals over here, internet. So there's a bunch of different internet types. And if it has internet, we have internet. So here I'll say has internet question mark. Over here, I'll compile up and I'll do a has internet here, just like that. Now I'm going to go redeploy this, let's say over to Android, for example, and go ahead and debug this again. So I use that same button click, add one line of code in my application, right? And then I'm just going to do a quick check to see if the network access is equal to internet. Um, I could also check to see if it has Wi-Fi or if it has, um, you know, cellular or something like that. Um, but it's going to do that. Um, here we go. So it's going to now deploy our application. You can see the second iteration of when I debug, it's a lot faster because we're just doing a diff, which is nice. Now we're, we're going to say not hello from, from iOS. We'll say check internet. There we go. Check internet, tap on it. And it totally has internet, which is great. I could come in over here and put it in airplane mode. Now, when I check internet, totally does not have internet, right? So it, it's looping into those native APIs at the end of the day, which is also really, really nice. I'm realizing now that when I zoom, it doesn't actually zoom in StreamYard. That's really funny. Yeah, um, I was able to say that. Yep. Yeah, no, so I no longer have to zoom. I bet if I use zoom it, I don't, I do have it. It's been a while. Oh, oh that <laughs> but now I can't interact with it. So anyways, you get the idea. Cool. So anyways, super quick, right? Just accessing native features is boom, built right into the box, which is super duper cool. All right. How am I doing? Doing a good on time. Cool. Oh, there's the same application running on Mac, iOS. You saw it running. It's cool. All right. Now, what's great here is that there's actually a vast <coughs> ecosystem, right? What I showed you is just stuff in the box, right? File new, playing around, some APIs, cool, 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 James, awesome, that's rad. What else is out there? Well, there's a vast um, amount of controls, components, plugins, libraries, and so much more that you can take advantage of. Many of these are coming from and being updated to .NET 6 and .NET MAUI from Xamarin and Xamarin Forms. So things like the Facebook SDK or Android X, uh, or things such as the Microsoft Authentication Library. Those have access now to .NET MAUI. But amazing UI controls from Telerik, SyncFusion, DevExpress, UX Divers, and a whole lot more. I have a few libraries on here, like in-app billing and the store review plugin. So in-app billing lets you like you know take money, make money off your application. That's pretty rad. I do that myself. There's fingerprint. There's gesture support. There's cross-platform graphics and a whole lot more. And it's been really cool to see what people build. So there's all sorts of really cool libraries like this one from Javier who like lets you do like all sorts of cool circular different forms and panes and stacks and things like that. It's called Maui pain. There's um, experimental like MVU style coding code first uh, with Comet, which is a cool project. Um, 
JetBrains is adding support for .NET MAUI and Rider, which is really awesome to see. People are building games like Sean over here, building real-time games, space games with his application. People cloning UI like Outlook, um, like Wordle, for example. Um, we have a UI challenge going on. So people are building these really beautiful UIs with .NET MAUI with all sorts of different uh, cool different application types, cool calculators, all these really cool things. Um, it's really cool to see in just a small amount of time the things that developers are able to build and scaffold out um, with .NET MAUI. So really awesome examples. And one example that we have is the .NET MAUI podcast app. And I think uh, Nish and Vivek are going to talk about it a little bit as well, which is a, a podcast application built with .NET MAUI that takes advantage of a bunch of native capabilities and theming and styling and runs across different platforms. So... If I open up that project, you'll see that it's a big application over here with a whole bunch of uh, different files in there as well. So a bunch of pages and views and view models and a bunch of stuff, MVVM goodness, all sorts of goodness in here. So many pages, things in here that are really cool. And in fact, if you go to the podcast, it's open source and the Microsoft GitHub. And you can look at it. It's powered. This is the full app. It's powered um, by Azure Container Apps and Azure Kubernetes uh, environments. Um, um, Signal R for listen together mode. There's a Blazor web app, uh, Azure SQL storage, and a bunch more. And you can just download it and run it immediately, which is really cool. Um, and let me go ahead and open it over here. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and open it on my Windows device and over here on Android as well. So we get .NET Podcast, we get our splash screen, and over here we get our uh, Windows app, we get our Android application. I can go and I can tap on, you know, podcasts, I can subscribe to them, um, which is pretty cool. I can go ahead and listen to podcasts, I can subscribe, I can listen later to them, um, which I think is uh, pretty awesome. There's a whole listen together mode. You can you know style it and uh, light theme, dark theme modes independently, uh, which I think is really fantastic. So here we can go ahead and say, I'm going to listen to this later, for example. Look at my subscriptions. I can subscribe. So we get this, you know, this beautiful UI that's inside of here. I can look at my uh, categories um, that are coming in. Should be coming in from the Internet. There we go. And sort of see the different styling that's coming in at the end of the day, which is really cool. So kind of like looking at a fully, you know, native application, uh, playing back audio uh, over here. So if I play a podcast, oh, I have no Internet. So oh, that's cool. It's all cached offline mode. Amazing. That's really cool. <laughs> so it says like a native player integration. So you can see that it's like up here playing back my audio through my, my speakers, which is cool. And it's all linked in, tied in there, which is which is really, really nice as well, which is cool. So on top of that, though, not only can you build things, this is a great reference sample application for you to like get access and start playing around with applications today, is um, that all these things are available out there, right? There's all these great samples or all sorts of stuff. And here's the, the, the URL for the podcast application to kind of see it all in action at the end of the day. Now, I have one last thing before I get out of here and let and take some more questions that are things are brewing here is what if I'm a web developer, right? And I want to take my web assets and build something hybrid. You know, this is a very common uh, pattern for developers and for web apps and for native apps and for desktop apps. Sometimes it's an entire application that is uh, hybrid and it has a basically a shell around it. And sometimes there is um, uh, applications that have a little bit of, of hybrid application, a little bit of web technology. And, and with .NET MAUI and Blazor, you can do that. So Blazor is our uh, full stack framework for building web apps with .NET. Uh, it enables you to build in three modes, um, in a Blazor server mode. Uh, it's component-based model and where you take advantage of server and server um, um, shadowing of DOM. It handles updates and enables you to build everything in C Sharp instead of JavaScript. You can also run things in WebAssembly mode, which is really cool to run things in the web browser disconnected um, in an offline state. So you can also do that as well, which is great. WebAssembly is an open standard. 
But Blazor is really cool because it lets you build those great web apps or even progressive web apps uh, for your desktop. And of course, .NET MAUI lets you build those great native applications. But the thing is that these teams work together because it's one .NET at the end of the day. And those teams came together and the Blazor team developed a piece of technology called Blazor Hybrid that works with multiple .NET UI, UI frameworks, including .NET MAUI. And what this means is that we can actually reuse existing web technology and build and mix and match native UI and web UI together. You can seamlessly ship this to the App Store and do all sorts of really cool things, but still access all of those native device capabilities. So this means that you can actually build this hybrid technology based on what type of app you need to build and what your background is. So you can not only build and ship a web app, a Blazor web app, you can also ship that same exact shared UI component in a .NET MAUI application and take advantage of the native .NET MAUI capabilities that I just showed you. So let me show you what that looks like really quick. So I'm going to open another project over here. Go ahead and minimize these here. Perfect. And before we created a .NET MAUI project, but I'm going to create a .NET MAUI Blazor application. This is a hybrid application powered by Blazor that enables me to use web UI directly in my um, .NET MAUI application and take advantage of all the Razor and all the Blazor ecosystem uh, as well, uh, which is really, really cool. So let me go ahead and have this open up here. There we go. Now, this is going to look pretty much identical to what we had before, but what we're going to see is that I mean, how do I do this? It's been a while since I. How do I? How do I? I need a handsome minute. I totally forget to how to draw arrows in it. But anyways, we get we get things like um, platform folders, resource folders. We get all the same startup code that we would expect. But when I tap on the Maui program, we're going to see that I also get this Maui Blazor web view. <clears throat> now I have access to all those resources. But I also inside my pages have a razor syntax and right here. So I have razor for button clicks and increase the counter that are here. And that enables me to create my .NET MAUI pages and put in Blazor web view control. So you can have as many Blazor web view controls as you want here. So this is really cool. And this is hosting web content. So that can be anything. It can be Blazor. It can be with it has bootstrap out of the box, but it could be tailwind. It could be anything you want. It could be a React components. It could be pretty much anything. But if I boot this up over on my Windows machine, what we're going to see is that I have um, a full .NET MAUI Windows WinUI 3 application, but using web UI and controls for my user interface. It's still hosted in a native application, but um, I am able to you know, still access the um, underlying capabilities at the end of the day. So if I boot this up, I'm going to take advantage of you know all the all the same stuff before we get the XAML live preview, right? We get that whole thing that's there. Um, I have my web view here. Um, this is using the underlying native web view. So web view two, Android web view, Android web view that's there. And then you can click and you can fetch data and you can do all this stuff. So right based on what you need, it's totally there, right? And this is great because if you are a web developer and you want to build native applications, you can do that and you can mix and match different UI. Like you can have a little bit of native UI and a little bit of web UI, right? You can ship those features faster. You can still come in here, for example, if I come into my counter, let's say I added another button here to, you know, check internet and said check internet there. I went ahead and did this uh, increment count and I said, check internet, check internet. I could still come in. I could come in and say, um, var has internet equals connectivity dot current dot um, network access. I expect to see if that equals internet. And then I could do, I could say app dot current dot main page dot display alert and i'll say internet question mark and then i'll say has internet just like we did before okay 
hit that there. Hit save. This should hot reload. Check internet. Boom. Totally has internet. Bop, 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 right? So you still have access to those native capabilities. If you want to, you can go into the platform folders, right? It's all available to you. Like it's there's no sandbox, right? You can mix and match these things, which is really cool. In fact, you can mix and match them so much that if I go over to my podcast application and I go over here and I look at the running application, this is an ASP.NET core page and I have a Blazor application. So it looks very, very similar. I can actually tap on an episode over here. I can start playing back that episode. And what's cool is that I could go into this listen together mode and I'm going to say James. Uh, I'll say James on Blazor. I'm going to open that room. And now I have this Blazor application. Now I can go over um, here, right? I can actually pin this and I could open a new tab and I could paste this in here and I could you know, go like this. I have two browsers open and I could say, you know, James on Blazor 2, hit join room. Now I have James on Blazor 2 and we're listening to the podcast together and I can send little emojis as we're like, you know, doing this. But I could also go into my podcast app and I could go into listen together and I could then copy this code, put this here, join this room. I'll say James on Windows, hit join room. And now I'm inside of a .NET MAUI application, right? This is all native UI over here. But this single view is a Blazor web view. This is actually powered by Blazor and SignalR. And I can actually send these emojis across the wire, right? Which is really cool. I can come into Android and do the same thing. I can go into my listen together mode over here. I can add my room code over here, which is cool. Join the room as well. James on Android. Join room. And now over here, Nish is here. Nish can send emojis and we can be listening to a podcast together. I can start and stop audio playback, right? And I'm getting all of these things as I would expect, which is really, really cool. Now, that to me is kind of mind boggling awesome, which is really, really cool. But what if I also told you that I was able to add that into my Listen Together page as a simple Blazor web control, that entire component was shared between my desktop application and my mobile application and my web application at the end of the day. Now, I might be saying, well, wow, James, this is really cool because I have all this native UI and all these native -y things. It's looking amazing. But what if I'm just a Blazor developer? And what if I don't want to write any native controls and I still want to take this web app and bring it in? You can do that too. Check this out. I have another version of the app that's in that repo right there that's called the .NET MAUI Blazor podcast application. And here in my main page, I actually have the entire .NET MAUI podcast application from Blazor. And I actually have it here on my desktop. I'm going to boot it up. And this application is 100% Blazor. This is a Blazor application. It resizes with CSS styling. I can tap on a podcast, subscribe, listen together, look at my subscriptions. I can do all the things that I would expect light theme, dark theme, all those things. I can style it exactly how I want it across the board. You can take the entire application. Now, what's cool here, though, is that this application, when I play back a file, if I look over here, I can actually show you that, wow, over here, we have the entire podcast app. It's sharing the components and pages from the web app. But then down here, we actually have a separate library for all the media audio playback. And this is native code, right? So instead of using a web control or a web JavaScript library to do audio playback, I am using native Android, iOS, Mac, and Windows code to do audio playback so my users get the best experience at the end of the day. Whew, amazing. So the choices are yours, right? You can choose if you just need to build a web app with Blazor, Create a site, a PWA, you're good to go. You're going to go fully native and get the power over here. You got .NET MAUI with XAML and C Sharp, and you're good to go. Or you can sit in the middle here, right? And you can use Blazor and .NET MAUI um, together in this hybrid mode, and you get the best of all worlds based on what you need to build, whatever type of developer you are. I'm not going to tell you what to develop. I'm going to tell you whatever makes you super productive, makes you happy at the end of the day, and that's what it's about.
Now, .NET MAUI is built into .NET, which means it's part of the .NET 7, .NET 8, .NET 9 roadmap because .NET releases every single year. What's cool about that is that in .NET 7, they're uh, featured and focused even deeper in desktop application development, adding context menu, cursors, hover, tooltips, uh, right-click gestures, and a lot more. They're adding maps, controls as well, and a whole bunch more. So definitely check out the roadmap for .NET MAUI. And additionally, since it is part of .NET, there is a new major version of .NET MAUI every single year. So when's the next version? The next version is going to be in November, and then November 2023, November 2024, right? It's going to be all of those back to back to back, which is pretty awesome. Now, .NET MAUI also as an optional workload in .NET means it can update out of band if it needs to. So for example, since there's dependencies with Xcode and Android SDKs, how do we make sure that, hey, if I'm on .NET 7, I don't have to wait till .NET 8 to get those updates, right? If iOS, you know, Xcode 15 comes out or 16 in the next versions. Well, even though .NET MAUI will ship, there will be basically 18 months of patches. So you have an additional six months after .NET 8 ships that will add the patches um, to support new versions of iOS and Android and Mac and Windows as well. So it's something that's pretty unique for .NET MAUI. So as you can you know, upgrade uh, as well to the latest versions of .NET, if you need to take advantage of those newer versions, you can still get those without having to update to the latest things there. Now, if you still on Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, you still have until May of 2024. That's the end of support lifecycle. Of course, your apps will still work, but you'll still receive support up until that time. You can get started at .NET forward slash Maui, download Visual Studio, and you'll be off to the races building all the cool stuff that's here. And that is totally it. Mm, one hour. Awesome. <laughs> there you go. As always. Great demo, James. It was, um, it, it was like watching a an you know, intense movie, like <laughs> like well, for one hour, I'm watching an intense movie. Like so many things happening, <laughs> and so many amazing stuff. Uh, yeah, I myself tried out tried a couple of things uh, a week before, uh, which is really cool. And uh, and people who are here, you know. Uh, you know, if you want to try it out, there is Cloud Scale Challenge, which we are running. So you can also go back and try it out. But where do we start, Nish? Where do we start with questions? I mean, yeah, there are so like... many questions. I try to answer a few <laughs> and I try to bring up those questions in between when you are answering those uh, uh, those relevant uh, uh, specific stuff. So um, I think this is uh, James, can we develop Maui apps using Visual Studio for Mac? Absolutely, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had a um, basically a screenshot of Visual Studio for Mac. And yeah, you install Visual Studio 2022 for Mac, the preview. So just, just Google that, and that'll come right up. Um, and that's what you'll need today. You just tap the .NET MAUI button. I think you also need to tap iOS and Android and things like that currently. So that'll be there that you need to install the, the Xamarin stuff alongside the MAUI stuff. But that'll all work there. But yeah, totally do that. What are the right. differences? Um, mm. Well, it depends. Donna, Visual Studio for Mac is still in preview, but obviously, um, you know, Visual Studio for Mac is focused on, you know, Donna Maui, Xamarin support, web development support, Council, Azure Functions, Docker support. Um, it's not going to have everything that you can do. Like, there's no um, uh, like currently there's no XAML like, live preview or um, um, uh, different trees, so they're building and adding tooling onto it. Uh, over time um, in general, but I go back and forth between the two based on what I'm doing. But I think the nice thing is that, you know, your integrations for um, um, for opening the projects and the, 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 and the integrations with Xcode and opening up, um, uh, opening up iOS simulators are all obviously integrated deeply into that in environment as well. So if you're on a Mac, you can use it on a Mac. If you're on Windows, you can use it on Windows, pretty much. Right. Um, so this is on the migration side of things. Like if people mm. have existing WPF application, um, do we have an upgrade path to dot in Maui? It's a good question. Uh, there's not like necessarily like a right click upgrade to .NET Maui. Um, pretty much you think about it, all your models, view models, all your .NET code should obviously, you know, come over gracefully. 
um, your XAML will need to be, you know, optimized and rewritten a little bit um, because the controls and things are a little bit different. You should sort of say like, okay, well, what are my goals? What do I need to do? Am I only ever going to ship this app on Windows? Like maybe don't upgrade it to anything else besides maybe .NET 6 with WPF. Um, and then you'll be good to go. You take advantage of the new .NET 6 stuff and .NET 7 when it comes out. That should be a relatively easy upgrade for versions of .NET. If you're like, hey, I have my WPF app and I need to go to other platforms, um, then you can look at, like, okay, what are my goals, right, uh, of it? Is it what .NET MAUI offers? There's other community projects and other libraries for .NET like Uno and Avalonia that help you do cross-platform UI with different UI technology stacks. Those might be good options too. That's the cool part about the C Sharp and .NET ecosystem is that a little bit of something for everyone. This is just what we offer from Microsoft, but all of those other projects like Uno's and Avalonia build on top of the iOS, Android, and Mac infrastructure that we provide there as well. But there is some guidance. I think if you just like Google that on looking at it, the differences, there's like a name comparison um, between yeah. the two, but most, most of the similarities are, most of the things that are different are with just some of the control names. Right. Um, and navigation think... and accessing native -y stuff, right? So, right. so on right. this on the similar lines, James, I know uh, there were questions around if I have if I am on Xamarin, uh, how mm -hmm. do I move to .NET MAUI? Is there is there an easy way? Yeah. So if you're migrating from uh, Xamarin Forms to .NET MAUI, there's a wiki article showing you how to do it. So the thing is, you can definitely like upgrade, change the namespaces. Like all of your XAML is backwards compatible. There are a few things in the rendering layers that might look and feel so you might have to make some tweaks. Um, but I think the difference is there is like a command line tool, an upgrade assistant that you can run, but it's not going to do the single project support. It's not going to upgrade to the latest and greatest, you know, um, startup code. So my thing that I'll be doing is like, I'll have my Xamarin forms app, then I'm going to add a new Maui project and then move code into it, upgrade it because my code you go to my YouTube channel or the .NET YouTube channel, we have all these great videos on all the new stuff, right? The built-in dependency injection service, these MVVM source generators, so you don't have to write any of this MVVM boilerplate code. It does all this stuff for you automatically. And that means that for my, my actual code, like I don't only just want to upgrade to .NET MAUI, I want to modernize and get rid of all this old stuff that I used to have to write that I don't have to anymore in .NET MAUI. So all these cross-platform images and stuff like that. So I look at it as, yeah, I can upgrade my code and change the namespaces, but is that going to bring me the most delight? Probably not. So I want to take a little bit of time to to move some of those other resources over, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, one question on this Blazor. Uh, I think this is something I know. I know you have covered this in your talk, but I think we can recap on that. Like, you know, how uh, the Blazor, the HTML part is being rendered versus the C# -sharp code that we write in Blazor. Correct. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, so Blazor Hybrid, it is neither WebAssembly and neither and I neither server side. It is not WebAssembly, it is not server side. It's a third mode. Think of it as Blazor as the third mode. You have Blazor server, Blazor WebAssembly, and then Blazor Hybrid. What Blazor Hybrid does is it brings the Blazor component model and web view control to these other platforms that already run.net, right? So your C sharp executable code is running on the .NET MAUI .NET for iOS, Android, Mac, or Windows. It's running just natively there. You don't need WebAssembly because .NET already runs on iOS and Android, right? You don't need a server because iOS, Android, Mac, there's a native web view control. So your HTML, CSS is all rendered in the iOS, Android, Mac, or Windows web view. And that's just whatever web views prevented. So web view and WebKit and web view two. But the C sharp code, your .NET code is executed on the .NET runtime that's already on the device because you're building a .NET MAUI application. So that means by default, it's disconnected. By default, it's super fast um, because it's optimized and ahead of time compiled. Yeah. Right. Um, so we just did 2022 for ARM. Yeah, not yet. No. So uh, Visual Studio 2022 for ARM was just released with 17.4 preview. Um, there are a few workloads in there that are supported today. The team's uh, working on it though. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
I think we are good. There, there are a few other questions that I think I answer, I got it in while you were talking. So, I guess, um, yeah, I guess I think we should go to the next one where we talk about the scalable backends, James. So let me bring in Trishal if she's around, uh, if she has any questions. Um, oh, I should say though, you can build mm -hmm. Maui applications to run on ARM devices. That works. Yep. So it's just if you're if you're developing with visuals if you have an arm machine right which i don't know how many people do i guess you have a surface x uh today there's a few other arm devices then mm -hmm. it's just at visual studio 22 for 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 windows what get the dot mi workload which it will but you today can build and deploy i do it today build and deploy dot mi apps for arm that works today so rogue to your question it already supports it because Windows apps support ARM. So I want to make that very, very clear before we get out of here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So let's, uh, that was a great session. Trishala, you, you have any questions for James? <laughs> wow. It was overwhelming for me. Amazing. Uh, amazing one. Uh, I actually learned a lot of concepts. But yeah, um, I was just seeing all the questions um, here. Um, you answered it so brilliantly. Uh, no questions from my side, but all I could say is, I mean, I think a lot of people are excited to learn more and get started with that. Awesome. Cool. I'm excited. Of course, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. Um, and then, yeah, I'll be around. I'll hang around in the chat on, on YouTube and see if I can answer a few more questions as well. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, James. It's been thank you, uh, James. Pretty great. <laughs> I know every time we ask you to do a session with us, like you are like, yes, I'm ready for it. Even though the time zones are like, you know, far apart. So thank you so much. And we will look forward for your next session very soon. Awesome. Yeah, thank good. you, Thanks, James. Everyone. I think you James. energized a lot of people today. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. All right, Vivek, uh, are you ready? James has set a high standard. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, all yeah. right. so, so, uh, uh, if people want to get uh, started with the Maui, right, we have the Cloud Skill Challenge. So, uh, we can go ahead and uh, deep dive into this uh, Cloud Skill Challenge. Uh, yeah, or else you can also join us tomorrow and try this out with us while yeah, we're so going to do this. Tomorrow we right, have Nish? this. Yeah, so tomorrow we have an in-person event. So if you are from uh, Bengaluru, you can come into Microsoft Office at Reactor, and we will be able to help you write your first Maui app. Um, and if you want to watch us do this, um, you can also join us online. So if you scan this QR code, you can get to that event and uh, sign up there. All right, so what else, uh, Vivek? Toe. So we're going to so the next talk session. about yeah, yeah back talk about how do we connect these apps to backend right so how, yeah. do, we, how do we scale it right so it's still now we talked about how to build the ui for the app and how to use it uh, from different platforms but now we'll go deep dive and see how we can uh, connect this to azure connect this to cloud so that you can scale your application right so let me go to the first gen pass. What is first gen pass, Nish? How was it? In a ten yeah, years so back, he, here's about? the thing. Yeah, here's the thing. So when you're building mobile apps, I think the one thing that we need to be sure of that we are bu building for millions of users who are going to use it within a short span of time. Like I mean, they 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 open the app, they are just there for a short span, and they want to have your app working there. So if you're connecting to the backends and things like that, make sure that your infrastructure is great, scalable, and it's also listening to those uh, users from around the world, from different geolocations and things like that, right? So um, I know as developers, one of the things that we start to focus very recently is when you start building microservices and things like that, we start to look at more as an infrastructure like Kubernetes and things like that. Like Kubernetes has become the de facto standard because when you build microservices, you have multiple uh, business domains that you need to work with. Then you have uh, you know integration between other services and things like that. So we we we, we it's overwhelming, right? Uh, so Pass was one of the options where people looked at um, okay, how do I how do I create a backend, right? Uh, so, but the, but if you look at the first gen pass, that actually focused on just the web applications. That's all about like if you are a HTML CSS developer and you are building some 
um, you know, de like websites, you are looking at deploying it to the uh, cloud provider, right? And basically what it was, was just an abstraction over the uh, VMs and infrastructure as a service. The biggest challenge that came with that is you're tightly coupled to the cloud provider, right? So that was the challenge with the first gen pass. That's why we started looking at how should we do the next gen pass? Like how do we how do we enable uh, developers who are writing backends for mobile, web, everything, like microservices, how do they get the benefit of the infrastructure that they have uh, without really you know, tuning into the cloud provider's um, uh, way of uh, writing apps behind, right? So, so when, mm -hmm. and I have used Heroku, you know, a long time back, mm -hmm. uh, obviously it was tightly coupled, right? Because it was deployed directly into the Heroku's uh, system, right? So yeah, I'm going to move on to the next gen pass, well, how this next gen looks like. Uh, obviously there is a support for containers and functions and uh, you could build your own pass in fact now, right? So. Uh, with all of these things, you can build your own pass and set it up uh, for your uh, users usage, right? So, what what are the other things you know, Nish? Uh, you think uh, next gen pass looks like for you? Yeah, I think so. So, so one of the important aspects is, as I mentioned, like you know, Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for your you know backends and uh, where the scalability comes into picture, right? But the biggest challenge with Kubernetes is being a developer, you start to focus on more on the infrastructure side, try to learn Kubernetes YAMLs, and try to understand how these um, nodes and you know pod scaling and all those things work. Um, so next gen pass is all about, uh, you know, you can build your backend, containerize them, but you don't have to really worry about um, the infrastructure under the hood. Instead, you bring in your own code model and it is very unopinionated. You can bring whatever, Java, .NET, whatever right so it doesn't matter you bring those in and then you you deploy as your package your application into images and then uh, we kind of like provide a way to scale your applications right um so it doesn't matter whether you're you may the day you want to don't want to use the cloud you want to go to on-prem you can take that with you right because you're not following a particular uh, guideline from um from the cloud provider and i think the important aspect here is also it's all you know, building on open source technologies and not something which you are baking in uh, under the hood or, you know, some, everything that is being offered is, can can be uh, looked at in the source code and see how this has been done. Definitely. And from an Azure application perspective, right? So today we are discussing uh, how do we put uh, your app, the mobile app, and connect with the backend or with the Azure platform, which is the cloud platform, uh, to scale your applications, as you told, right? Uh, if you're building a mobile application, you know, it has to be scalable and you're building it for a uh, global audience, right? So if people are using your app, so it has to be scaled. And there are different options in within Azure. Um, uh, you could use Kubernetes, you know, you could even go back and use virtual machines. Um, obviously, there are databases, different kinds of databases which you can use, uh, and some kind of uh, services as well, which is cognitive services and other services to make sure that you have AI built into your application. And also, there is tooling uh, part of it, right? There is a bunch of uh, tooling which is existing for you to drive stuff. But today, we are going to discuss about platform as a service, right? So there is a couple of things that Azure App Service, Spring App, uh, container apps, and you could also use functions. Uh, one of the demo which uh, even uh, James did was on the podcast app and which we are also going to deep dive into how it is architected and how we are going to, and how it has been set up. Uh, even before we go there, uh, we are going to talk about Azure Container Apps uh, uh, just for the introduction purpose. Uh, and also we have a specific session on Azure Container Apps coming up uh, and the Azure Happy Hour uh, on 16th of September. So I'm looking forward to it. And Nish is going to go deep dive into that uh, Container Apps as well. So uh, moving on, uh, Nish, uh <clears throat> what is azure <clears throat> container apps uh go ahead and uh, just i was i was very very excited audience. yeah i was i was very very excited when they announced azure container apps it wasn't preview i got some early preview too and tried this out it was really amazing i mean 
Um, so if you if if people didn't know my background, like I, I worked on Xamarin for a very long time, and then I moved into microservices world. Um, like I maintain the dot dot net slash architecture. There's there's amazing reference guides, and one of the reference samples that I maintain is called the eShop on containers, which is a humongous sample with. Uh, uh, it's still a reference sample, but we talk about microservices. How do you, um, you know, containerize your application to, you know, writing CQRs and, you know, creating bounded context and, you know, deciding what is your business boundary for your microservices and things like that. Um, and uh, and it also has an eShop mobile client. That's something which we, which was working on Xamarin Forms. We put it to .NET MAUI, and that is the wiki that we are talking about where there is a migration guide story as well in that. Uh, well, coming back to Azure Container Apps, I mean, the biggest thing at the shop and containers was to maintain Kubernetes Helm charts and YAMLs and scripts like that. It just Kubernetes is fun. I mean, don't get me wrong; it's amazing. Uh, but the problem, the challenge that YAML comes with is, is yeah, YAML yeah, and hard. and getting a new developer on board it, it was super hard because it it has a lot of infrastructure related learning curve that you need to understand. If you did not have that kind of a background, it it would be hard for you to. I mean, you will get stuck just. Um, figuring out how these things all worked or came together, right? So Azure Container Apps is built on top of Kubernetes, uh, but kind of giving you the layer uh, hidden from in that. You know, you don't have to do any of those things that you do in Kubernetes. And I'll, I have recorded the demo and I'll show you how this is done. Um, the good thing about Container Apps is that you know it's it's simply a serverless container platform. So basically, if you have container, that means if you have a Docker image, if you have a code that you can put it into a Docker image, and it ha it can be two or three things. Like, for example, it can be uh, a REST API or a gRPC endpoint that it's listening to, or it could be a worker template or a something like a background services, right? As long as you can containerize it, it you know, con Azure Container Apps can just simply run it. And uh, basically, because it is directly targeted to microservices and the developers, uh, it focuses on a few things like service-to-service -service communication um, that is brought in by a technology called Dapper, which is again an open source technology, right? And if you want to do load balancing, uh, like, you know, you want to do HTTP traffic between 80% traffic to you, one of your uh, um, front of one of your services, which is like in beta, probably to twenty percent traffic. Sorry, twenty percent to the beta and eighty percent to your uh, large production and things like that. So, if you want to do some kind of load balancing, you have onward proxy. Again, it's an open source technology, right? And uh, the other interesting thing that I love about Azure Container Apps is the CADA. It, it, de de using the CADA, it actually you can actually set a trigger. For example, if I have an Azure storage and I I have a lot of messages there, based on the messages and the queue count. I can scale my containers. So that's just a simple configuration that I, and I'm not even writing in YAML. I can write it in Bicep or a, uh, you know, ARM template, which is nothing but uh, the Azure uh, Resource Manager template. So you, those are JSON files, and you can just write them there. And then you, part of your CI CD, it takes care of um, you know, deploying and scaling depending on uh, what is in your storage and things like that. All right, uh, let's go to the next slide. Oh, these have come up some of the example scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, right, there is uh, HTTP traffic, which you can uh, divide, split between two different uh, versions of your application. So basically, if you have two uh, containers and you have revision versions, and you can set uh, the percentage uh, on top of these versions, and you can obviously auto scale on top of it. And you mentioned, right, as you can build an auto scaling system based on the uh, level of usage, basically CPU or memory load and other things. And obviously, uh, you know, the scaling by messages in the queue, uh, which is which is one more uh, way of doing it. And uh, microservices, this is the most amazing uh, use case of uh, container apps, right? Where you have dappers and have Keda for scale purpose, scaling for a specific uh, triggers and dappers to interact between different services. And uh, we will see all of these things in a demo. Uh, obviously, yeah. Not today on sixteenth, couple of uh, deep dive sessions which we are going to do. But on in this my demo, today. yeah, I do have an end to end coverage in terms of like which is tooling tooling support. As a developer, you don't have to worry about infrastructure at all. And to to the point that we will be showing how .NET podcast architecture behind the scenes where we use Azure Container Apps. Um, so I, I'll be covering those aspects for sure today. Perfect. So let's go ahead and spend some time on how this exactly works, right? So 
you have containers, containers in, in the Kubernetes world, you know, you call it them as pods and you, you just go and deploy this, uh, you know, these containers onto container apps and you can see there is an environment uh, which is basically uh, you can deploy these different uh, container apps within the same environment uh, to have those connectivity. So if you have dappers, uh, it can easily discover different uh, services so this is this is where uh, the environment comes into picture where you have microservices uh, being deployed on top of that and it's pretty easy to do this right and i'll i'll show you uh, while doing the demo like if you have a github repo and how you can uh, in fact uh, deploy this to deploy code to azure container apps as well so um any anything else you want to talk about nish before i go and deep dive into the demo uh, just a quick thing, the container environment is basically the outer boundary where you want to keep all the apps that if, for example, if there are services that you need to connect to each other, like using Dapper, then uh, it needs to be in the same virtual network. And that's what the container environment is all about. And revisions are uh, are, are something which is um, like, you know, having multiple uh, versions Versus. of your own yeah, apps, uh, services, um, and uh, you can actually switch between them. You can do A-B testing or you can do blue-green blue deployment. So those are revisions, but these are all familiar concepts that you already know. It's just that it is there in these kind of business boundaries and the configuration, the way you try to achieve them uh, may be slightly different from what you may be used to already. Perfect. Yeah, so, so that's a code push think, thing which you, um, yeah. sorry? I think, I don't know. This is a simple. Sorry, there push. was a there's a lag here. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was just saying that you know technically once you set this up entirely, the CI/CD pipeline is set. I mean, if you even now you can go and take a look at the .NET podcast app. It's a it's one of the nicely done CI/CD pipelines. You can actually fork the repo, uh, just change some sec add add some secrets to your GitHub uh, actions. Uh, sorry, GitHub. Um, yeah, GitHub, GitHub action secrets. Uh, once you add that, and it'll take care of deploying everything, and then you can uh, you can see how the CI/CD pipeline is all set up, and it's pretty easy. Uh, it's a, it's a great sample to kind of look at and see how uh, you can uh, use this in your business apps too. Good, perfect. So let me just do a quick demo. Okay, so let's go and take some code. Uh, this is a simple Blizzard app, which even uh, James was showing. So uh, nothing much. Uh, it's already there, and uh, and we are not going to do much of a change. Say, for example, we have a Microsoft Reactor demo, and we'll just remove this and say, okay, Microsoft Reactor, and just save it. Uh, we we save something there, and uh, let's go and build this app, uh, and I'll basically build it. You know, in fact, as a container. Um, let's do that with version nine of this so it's a blizzard app it's a simple blizzard app the one which we already seen so i've just made some changes to the title just to for the demo purpose and it's getting built and once it is built what we are going to do is we are going to push this to the azure container registry so i already have a couple of things um, let me show you this so all resources so let me go to this container registry. So I already have container registry set, uh, Azure container registry, and uh, container apps is also uh, being deployed, but it's pretty easy to create a container apps as uh, we were discussing. So I just go to create resource uh, and go to containers here and go to container apps. You select any of these. Give it a name, vtest001, and you have an environment. So this is the environment which we were talking about. And this is, you know, just you can go and create a new environment as well uh, with, uh, you know, redundancy and other things for the scaling purpose. As we talked about, it's a basically about creating a VNet and virtual network of this. Uh, and you can give it a name or, you know, you can go back and monitoring and networking these are all default and you can also use the one which is you already have uh, if as you it will ask you the details uh, then you can just go and create it and just review and create so when you do this review and create 
uh, basically you will get a container apps ready with all of these three things which is log container apps and the environment okay so it will be set uh, and uh, it is all ready and container registry is all ready for demo purpose it is all ready for now and uh, we can go back and see that this is going to be the page and this is what we edited and it's all up and running now so new version is what we have just uh, created and what we are going to do now is we go here and go to docker and we did create version 9 so we're just going to push this into azure okay so it gets pushed to the azure container registry it will be quick so as um, Nish was mentioning, you know, we go to the container registry, sorry, uh, the container apps, uh, you will see a couple of things here, right? There is, um, you know, secrets, there's authentication, there's continuous deployment. You can easily set continuous deployment. You just go to continuous deployment, you know, select your uh, GitHub, rep, you know, ID, organization, repository on which the code is and where you want to uh, push your container and everything and then all set and it will go and it will be you know GitHub uh, actions will be ready for you and you can just go back and use it right and there is dappers and everything is ready and if if i go to the revision management here is the you know you know couple of revisions also you can have uh, currently i have only one you can have more uh, here is where you can choose which mode you want to have is that you want to have a single active mode or you want to have a multiple active mode uh, you can make those choices and for example now we want to go and uh, deploy a new version or we can go and update this version right so you can add a new uh, version uh, revision as well or you can just go back and update this because right now i already have version 8 but now we're going to move it to version 9 because we already pushed the um, image right to the uh, container registry now version 9 is ready and i'm going to save this and everything is up so i'll just create this is a new deployment you might see that you know this has to go and it will be just microsoft reactor so it's attempting to connect so it is getting deployed right now. It should be up. So yeah, so demo is gone and this is what it is. And by the way, when Nish, uh, the question is up there for you. Uh, when are we having What's samosa and chai? Now we're having samosa and chai. Oh, the que okay, that it? question. I did. I, I was looking at the question and the. <laughs> okay, so the question okay. is, hello, Nish. By the way, I I saw someone asking what is samosa. So those of you who are following us from outside of India, in India we have a snack called samosa, uh, which is um, uh, I don't know potatoes, masalas baked into a thin layer of um, I don't know. Onions. How do I put this? Yeah, audience. So I, I, I okay. think we are going to bring in Trishala now. <laughs> Next up. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, that's a chat. So basically, the show was started as a chai time or a, or a tea time uh, chat, and that is why the name is Samosa Chai. And uh, so okay, answering to your question, Vivek, when are we having Samosa and Chai tomorrow? Because we are going to learn at Reactor, right? Um, we are yeah, we are doing some hands-on code on Dot in Maui. Definitely. I think I think tomorrow uh, we're meeting at Microsoft Reactor Bangalore. And if you're in Bangalore, just hop in. And uh, obviously, you have to be registered. So here is where you can register. And uh, you can just hop in. Else, you can also join us uh, online. We will be live. And we're going to uh, do this three hours of hands-on hands -on workshop on Movi. Like, you can try it out on your own. So that's what it is. So Nish, I'm going back uh, because this is just an introduction to container apps, right? So, yep. but now we want to see how exactly this works with the mobile app. 
development. Yeah, sure. So go to the next slide. So we have this amazing .NET podcast app. And um, so James and I worked with the teams to build this app. And uh, the, the, the thing that we try to tell people when we are building is like, we're not going to make it complicated. It's going to be extremely simple for people to get onboarded and get started. Uh, so that's where the architecture is also very simple. I mean, it's something which can be resonated with everyone, like, you know, understanding how to build a podcast app. So you saw the the listen together mode where we were able to send reactions and things like that. Uh, that was built in uh, a Blazor uh, hybrid and then connected with SignalR. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, Vivek, um, so I'll just explain the architecture there. So basically it has the .NET MAUI app and it also has the Blazor app, which is the web application that you saw. And and, the, and there's a part of it, which was called the listen together component. That's what we kind of like matched it with the hybrid scenario where let's say in a, in a situation where you have, you want to get to native, but you have this hybrid app, uh, sorry, if you have this web thing ready. And if you want to bake that into mobile quickly to see be to do a user testing whether people are liking it or not uh, you know to, to look at that scenario like that you know we we, we picked in into the uh, web browser and then uh, everything on the c sharp side of things run on the blazer uh, on the runtime and everything html css rendered on the uh, on the browser side of things um the important thing is it connects to the azure container apps i mean when vivek was doing the demo one thing you would have seen is it gives you that url and that URL is given to you uh, automatically by Azure Container Apps. So if you were to do it in Kubernetes, you will you will set the load balancer, get an IP, and then you configure DNS. Uh, that's that's a really heavy work to do. But ACA, what it does is it gives you that URL. It also gives you the HTTPS endpoint. That means it's a secure line uh, when you're connecting with your mobiles and things like that, right? Um, so in the Azure Container Apps, there are three main um, container apps there. One is the podcast API, which is nothing but a REST endpoint, which is listening to all the, um, uh, for example, the mobile apps connecting and checking for new podcasts and things like that. It also has um, an API to uh, get a new podcast request. For example, if I if I know that a new .NET podcast exists and I want it to be in that app, I can submit a request uh, using this podcast API. And the AP what podcast API is doing is it's not going to take it and then directly put it in the database because we don't want spams. So what we do is we put it into a storage queue, and that's where we are using the Azure storage queue. And as and when the and the messages increases, we have the podcast ingestion service, which is nothing but a background task. It's going to wake up. It's going to be like for for the first time when you deployed, we say okay, scale is zero. That means the app is not even going to be running. So when it when it actually sees a feed queue being filled, that's when it just kicks in. And that's the beauty of Azure Container Apps because it's using Kata to know what it's actually listening to the storage queue. And if there is a message, that's when we are actually bringing uh, the ingestion service into the picture, uh, processing that information. Basically, it's a very simple one. We are just looking for .NET in the title or MAUI in the title or Blazor in the title and then approving them uh, into the databases, right? Uh, so it's a very simple app. Now, uh, to show you the, the Azure Pass from uh, more than one scenarios, we also use the Azure App Service Linux, which uh, uh, which is again, you know, you containerize it, and you can once it's a container image, you can choose to deploy to Azure Container Apps, or you can choose to deploy to Azure App Service for Linux. Um, so, so both the SignalR Hub and the and the web server, uh, we showed it how to do it in Azure App Services. So, um, we, what you're going to do is, I have what I did is because I want to show the entire aspects of this, I recorded the video. Uh, so I'm going to play that video. And the reason for that is because if I have to do this live, I would have to wait for the Azure to kind of kick in and deploy. And I would not be able to show you the entire scenario. So I wanted you to see the entire end-to-end -end scenario from a developer perspective, how easy it is to get started with Visual Studio, connect to Azure Container Apps, and to set up the CI/CD and things like that, which is automatically done. And then also to briefly look at uh, the scalability aspect that I talked about Azure Container Apps, uh, which are very relevant to uh, the mobile applications and things like that. So, so Nish, let's go ahead and before mm -hmm. before we go there, right? So yeah. the container apps, which is which is deployed here, is is basically uh, in one environment, or it has different container apps, or it how is yeah, it? it is it is a single environment. So or both podcast yeah. API, podcast ingestion, podcast updater, they are all working in a single environment. Because again, as I mentioned, you know. Um, the reason why you want to look at a different environment is when you do not want two services to work with each other, like they want in a secure yeah. environment. Otherwise, it's it's okay to uh, use a single environment for this, right? 
Cool. Got it. Let's go ahead and play this video and it's going to play it to the stream and I will be muting myself so that it doesn't look weird. Podcast API backend in Visual Studio. Create a new project, choose ASP.NET Core Web API, provide a name and make sure to check the Docker support in it and then click create and this will give a default Web API project. And because it has Docker file in it, the Visual Studio detects that Docker was not running, so it goes ahead and starts Docker Desktop. Take a bit of time, but then it just goes and builds the images, and then now we're ready to go. The project by default gives me a weather forecast endpoint, so I'm going to change that to something like categories, which may be relevant to the podcast API. I'm going to leave the implementation as is because it's, I'm just going to create as a sample. But I'm also going to create another endpoint, which is called shows, and I can just remove those weather forecast implementation there and I'm just simply going to return a string. Uh, probably I'm going to write return all episodes or, or maybe, maybe I can just type return shows, which is great. Now I have two endpoints. I'm going to change the name as well, and I'm going to run this in Docker. When I do run, you can see that I have a, by default, I get the swagger endpoint. So I have categories and shows right there. I can expand it and execute, and you can see the response has shows in it. Now. Let's go and publish this in Azure. So if you right click and publish, you get this menu and you can choose Azure here. You can also choose Docker Container Registry if you're just simply creating an image. Now here I'm gonna choose Azure Container Apps. You see preview, but it's, it's now GA, but I'm gonna choose that and click next. Now this one gives me uh, to select container apps. I'm gonna create a new one. I'm gonna create a name. It creates environment. It provides resource groups and other things. Make sure you select the right ones and then click create. Now this will go ahead and create the environment for me. The one more step over here is to create the registry as well so that you want to keep it in a secure registry, the images that you create. So I'll just choose mine, which is already there, which is the niche demos. So I'll go ahead and click finish. And now you can see it already created an endpoint for me ingress with including HTTPS there. And that comes free for it Azure Container Apps, right? I can go and choose Swagger to see, all right, there's nothing there. Now I need to publish because that's when my image is going to be picked up by container apps, right? So I do that, and now let's go see what's the response. Now if I go do Swagger, I should be getting the same thing that we saw earlier. That's it, categories and shows right there. We'll also look at how to publish this into Azure App Services as well. So this is also available in Visual Studio. So this time I choose Azure App Service on Linux, click Next, and then choose the App Service instance that I want to deploy to. I don't have one, so I'm going to create a new one and call this as Podcast API Test, choose a hosting plan, and create. And because I'm working with APIs, uh, Visual Studio also give me, gives me one more step. If I can, if I want to, I can go ahead and create this API management as well so that I can secure my APIs and provide this endpoint instead of the uh, other endpoint created by the app services. And I can create all sort of policies uh, to let people in, right? So I'm gonna just create it with a podcast as an API URL suffix. So this is gonna be, the Visual Studio is gonna to talk to the Azure app services and Azure API management and create necessary things that is required. It's all done in Visual Studio, so I click finish. It's gonna go do everything that it needs to do to get things ready for us. So it's gonna take a little bit of time. In this video, I'll just a little bit fast forward it, but it'll take a bit of time, but it's all gonna work great. Now, if you look at podcast API management, which is what created there, so you see that there's a gateway URL. Now I can navigate to that URL and see if my endpoint is accessible. So it says no access denied because it requires a subscription key. And that's the thing that comes default. So I can go ahead and disable that for this demo. Uh, you can think of how else you want to secure these APIs. Uh, those, are, those policies can be written. But for this demo, I'm just gonna remove the subscription required checkbox from here. So if I go ahead and uncheck the subscription required and then go down and then there's a save option click on that and this is going to you know refresh the uh, endpoint now if I go back uh, to the API uh, endpoint with categories and let's say refresh this and now you may see the uh, categories uh, basically the weather forecast whichever whatever you wrote all right so far this source code is on my local so I can go ahead and add to my source control I'm going to choose github you can choose Azure DevOps if you want to but I'll add in GitHub credentials here so that I can publish this repository into my GitHub. So I'm gonna enter my details there and also change a few things like, uh, let's go ahead and change the name, repository name to podcast 
hyphen API instead of dot. And I'll leave that to be a private repository for now, but you can go ahead and change it if you want to. Create and push. So this will take care of taking my uh, source code and publishing it there. Now if I do a publish again, it asks me for registry. That's okay because I have it. Now look at this, it has CI CD option as well. So instead of publishing directly to Azure, I can choose this option. What it is gonna do, it's, it's gonna create a CI CD pipeline as well for me. And this is all Visual Studio doing all the amazing things that it can do, right? So now it says, whatever you go change, and then if it's push, then it is going to go and deploy as well. So just to see this working, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the endpoint, or I'm gonna add the endpoint, we call this as episodes, and then simply let's call it as uh, episodes, let me type it right, that's it. And then commit the changes as always. Now, if I say commit all, and then the next step is syncing. So I'll go ahead and sync this repository. So now my local and my, re my remote is synced. So I'll go back to check. So I'll log into my GitHub. And in this case, I'll just directly go into my repositories. Uh, forgot the name that I gave. So I'll go to the repositories and then search for it. I think, yeah, it's that Spotcast API test. So I'm gonna click on that. And there you go, you can see that, you know, it's already running. So that means the workflow is all set up for me. And this is all done by Visual Studio. I did not even uh, type all these things in, right? So you can go and change it if you want to. Uh, so there's all source code there. So there you go, it's built and deployed to container registry, and then it is gonna pull into container apps as well. So if I refresh, there you go. So now I have the new endpoint set up. So you can see how CICD entire pipeline is also set up for me. Great, just to recap, we created a new project in Visual Studio, which is a core web API project. We added Docker support into it, and then we modified a few endpoints, which are great. We ran it locally, that's all fine. That's something which you probably already know. What we did is right-click publish, and where we chose Azure Platform as a Service offerings, which were Azure Container Apps, and Azure App Services for Linux. We also looked at Azure API management. The important thing is how easy it is to set up from set all these things from Visual Studio. You didn't have to go anything, do anything in CLI, do anything in Azure Portal, but Visual Studio took care of everything that is required. And we also looked when we added the source code to GitHub repository, it also gave me an option to set up the CI CD pipeline as well. So that means it just go, goes and creates a GitHub Actions workflow files for me. So the basic setup is done for me. So I modify the code changes, it can directly deploy into something like Azure Container Apps, which is even awesome. Now let's take a look at .NET Podcast app, which you can find on github.com slash Microsoft.NET hyphen podcast. Now this is a simple podcast app, which has a .NET MAUI front end, which connects iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac, and also has scalable backend, which includes Azure Container Apps. If you look at the architecture of .NET Podcast, it has the .NET MAUI frontend, which means it has iOS, Android, Mac OS, and Windows application. It also has a hybrid app baked into it, which uses Blazor, that's the Listen Together one. We'll see that in a bit. Now, if you look at the backend, it has Azure App Services. Now, this is great. It has a couple of things, Podcast API, Podcast Ingestion, Podcast Worker. Well, Podcast API is just nothing but the web API endpoint, which we saw earlier and podcast ingestion and worker, they're all background services. They are running behind the scenes uh, to particularly looking at some functionality. So in this case, let's take an example. Like if someone wants to submit a podcast, they can access the podcast API and submit the podcast uh, with certain information. But now all the podcast that is submitted shouldn't be going into our database. So what we do is we send it to an Azure storage account, it's into the feed queue, and their podcast ingestion service is actually going to look at it and it is going to process them. And if it is relevant to this .NET podcast, it is going to pick that up and then send it to the SQL Server database. Now there's also Log Analytics workspace. This all comes within the Azure Container Apps. We also have SignalR for show, uh, doing listen together, which is really amazing. That is when you want to share a particular podcast with somebody else and then want to react and respond uh, to certain things that are spoken there. We use SignalR and show you how to do that, including the place of WASM there. Finally, this is a great architecture to see how to build a simple podcast app. If you open this podcast app in Visual Studio, you'll see a Docker Compose file, which is a great way to run multiple uh, applications within the containers locally. Now you can send some environment variables here, 
But that's all, I'm not going to get into the details of these, but let's look at how to run this, right? So if you go to Docker Compose, you can run it, but I want to show you this Docker Compose launch settings where you can choose which ones you really want to debug and the other ones you can just simply say you do not want to debug so that that way you're only working with the services that you absolutely need to debug. Now I'll go ahead and run this all together. So it's going to boot up everything. It's going to build all the images and there you go. So now I have the podcast API endpoint, which is with all the feeds and other things where you can submit a new podcast or you can also query for podcasts, which is already in there in the database. I can also go to 5001, which is a listen together hub. It's a signal our service. And I have 5002, which is the podcast website. And now this is a web page. And if you click sign in, now this is a Blazor uh, app. If you go in, I can you can see that the ones that I've subscribed to and I can start playing. You may not be able to listen to the music. I'm able to hear here. Uh, I can modify a few things like increasing the speed and things like that. It's accessing these APIs uh, for uh, running the uh, soundtrack uh, onto the audio channels, right? So now if I go to the listen together mode, this is very, very exciting for me. If you see, I can create a new room so that I can invite others to join. So here I'm going to give my name as Nish and start opening the room. So now I have the invite code or the copy code. Now I can send this to somebody else. Uh, now, because while recording this, I don't have another person here, so I'm going to use a new private window and open the same URL. And now I'm a new person here. And if I go to the listen together mode, I can join the room using the code that was created there. So if you'd see, that's the code that we created. If I copy paste that and say join the room, now I can give Matt as another user here. I'm just going to show you an example. So I'm going to go side by side. You can see the dark theme and the, the bright theme. And if I play here, you can see on the right, that also plays. And I can also send my reactions so for certain things that's been spoken there. So that way you can see how two apps are connected and it is able to uh, react and respond to things. This, this is all the magic of Signal R. And if you are excited about uh, doing this, something like a chat app, you can go ahead and take a look at the source code and implement something for yourself. Now, what I did not show you today is executing the .NET MAUI app, which you can also try it for yourself. If you go into that podcast app, there is a folder where you can execute the MAUI uh, apps. You can make sure that you have MAUI workloads so that you can run this locally. You can also debug them locally or connect to the remote services. Uh, they are all going to work great. Just go to the .NET podcast um, GitHub repository and it has all the instructions to get you started. What I love about this architecture is that we are using Azure Container Apps as the mobile backend. The good thing about that is it obviously supports the auto scalability feature, which is what we are going to look at it right now. And um, the other thing is it can scale down to zero, which means you can save some cost too. So this is all done using, um, uh, using Keda. Uh, so we're not going to go into the details of it, but I'm going to show you in .NET Podcast how we managed to uh, use this feature. Remember I told you there's a feed queue where every podcast that has been submitted goes in and let's see how that podcast uh, ingestion service is scaled. Now in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the ARM template where we write the details of podcast um, container apps. Within the container apps configuration, we kind of like provide the details of we need an ingress, uh, which that means we need to expose it externally. And then we have a few things that we can set it up here, which is one of the things is the scalability factor, which I was talking to you about. So right now there's a min replica is one, max replica is five. That means based on the scalable rule that we set here, in this case, HTTP scaling, that means if you have 20 concurrent requests or more, then uh, container apps is gonna scale your apps automatically. And the good thing is if you set min replica to zero, you can also scale down to zero when there is absolutely no traffic as well. If you look at the ingestion service, we set the min replica to be zero and the max, max replica has to be five, which makes sense for this service. If you look at the scalability rule here, we are looking at the feed queue, which is the storage queue, which I was talking about. So if we have really a lot of feed queue, uh, sorry, queues of podcasts coming in, and that's when we want to scale. So depending on the queue length, we scale to maximum of five replicas, and that is going to go ahead and process those uh, new podcasts that is coming in and ingest into the database. To see this in action, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, a simple script that is going to send in a lot of uh, new podcasts into the service. So here we go. 
So I have something called a simulate hyphen feed hyphen request dot ps1 and I'm hitting those URLs which is nothing but the podcast API web point and on the top left you can see the message count going up to 57, 50 and on the right and left those are the replicas one is the web API on the top and the bottom is the worker and now I'm again hitting more so that you know we can see the scalability and you can see that on the top uh, based on the web scaling rule there are two replicas now and in the bottom there is this worker which has now increased to three replicas now that is so cool that it automatically is able to do that now if you look at the workers uh, you know look at the handler part of it all that it is doing here is basically uh, this worker is going to be initiated this is a fairly simple one all that it is doing is looking for the dotnet keyword in its title and accepting it so based on certain configurations we were able to scale up as and when there is demand all right now let's go look at the uh, portal on how this has been configured so see these are the things that gets defaultly configured and if I go into the podcast API CA which is container apps and if I wait for a little bit of say time you'll see the URLs and things like that come up there so that's the URL which it's been hosting the API now if I go to the dapper if I have to enable dapper I can go ahead and do that uh, but for this demo I am not using dapper so I have, I have disabled it uh, I can go into the containers or scale, for example, and see what is the configuration. So if I have to do this in portal, I can also go ahead and do that. But I think it's better to do it in the uh, in your ARM templates and uh, CICD takes care of everything that way, right? Cool, this is the ingress where the external traffic has been enabled or disabled. It's a pretty cool demo, so I hope you liked it. All right, so that was pretty much a packed content into a single video, <laughs> you know? I knew I knew that we needed to get it to 15 minutes, but I needed to show so many things that I needed to, uh, because Visual Studio has some really amazing features for where you don't see it. Everything is running on Kubernetes, and I did not do anything Kubernetes. I did not move out of the Visual Studio. I was able to do everything from Visual Studio, and that was the, uh, the key message that I really wanted to stress upon. You need at least uh, two to three some such high episode to do it live. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, that's the back content there. <laughs> I know, I know. If if folks, if you find this video to be really fast and you didn't understand, so this the the same URL where you're watching this, you will see the video again. So feel free to go back and and pause and watch as you as you want to uh, see it. And also um, let us know. I mean, if you have any questions, I, I know some questions came in. Uh, we can take those questions as well. But before that, we can we can wrap up on things that you wanted to say so that. Yeah, that's it. So I think I think we are done with all the demos today, and mm -hmm. uh, this is the cloud scale challenge which we are running. So please uh, take a look at it, and uh, you know try the movie yourself, right? So that's something uh, interesting. So I completed uh, one of the module there, so which is you know getting started with it, right? So even I'm a beginner there, so it is amazing. So there is a couple of things in that uh, seven part uh, learn module. So go ahead and try it out. And if you want to join us, uh, probably uh, tomorrow, you can also join us. So I'm going to show you where you can go back and sign in, but also we will put it in the chat as well. Where is it? Where is it? Here. You can also join us tomorrow and try it with us. Right? Right, Nish? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'm just looking at questions if we have any on that side. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Paolo regarding do I have to update my parts to use Dapper and not to use the container services? Um, you don't have. Uh, yeah, yes and no, it depends. Like, for example, if you just want to enable Dapper APIs in your container services, you just go and toggle the switch. But if you want to make use of it completely um, using those Dapper sidecars, um, like if you have messaging things, you have contracts that you want to connect to, uh, all those things you may want to use uh, how Dapper uses, like local host slash. Uh, and, and if you're using a state store, you use state store and things like that, like we want. So those those aspects you may have to modify in the URL and, and make slight changes so that um, your app is aware of the sidecar. Okay, definitely. So yep. I think I think it's a similar question to I have containers that already access the service bus. For instance, do I have to modify my code to use Dapper? Um, well, 
I think if you want to make use of Dapper in its full potential, you probably want to modify it so that you use them as a contract. And the, the advantage you get is you not only as, as a service bus, if you futurely switch to something else, you can change the Dapper's configurations and switch to those service buses too. Yep. I, I mean, whenever you enable Dapper, uh, not much of a code change. So that's still, still yep. usable. Right? Yep. All right. So we make yet Whoa. another episode of Simosa Chai. That's yeah, pretty awesome. That was fully packed and how many hours? Like two and two and a half hours now? <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> All right. Let's okay. wrap it. Let's wrap Thank it. you. Thank you, folks, for joining in. Thank you, Nish, for hosting. And thank you, Trishala, for hosting the session. See you. Take care. Bye bye. Good night. Good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Bye, take care.